OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. All right, it's half past seven. It is uh, Monday morning. If you want to get involved, we'd love to hear from you. What kind of a weekend was it for you? Uh, 087 980 180. That's the WhatsApp number. Or, of course, you can leave a comment on the YouTube stream. And uh, the best place to get us for the Gillette Labs performance rankings is in the comment box on our Instagram stories. Are we going to talk or are we just going to get straight into it? What do you think? You want to talk? You want to talk? We can talk. You want to do a little highlights and then go straight into it if you like. There's so much to do in this performance rankings. But uh, we can chat away there before we go into it. It's one of those busy mornings. Paddy Clifford's back heel didn't make it. <laughs> it was an honourable mention. It was actually his brother was the honourable mention, first of all, for his stellar year. Uh, we wanted to highlight him, but then the back heel uh, is actually there for a viewing pleasure. Oh, there yeah. Look at this now for people who can't see. Little build so up play here. Explain the score. Scores uh, 17 to 70 points to 1 6. Pl- uh, Clifford gets the ball here. He's turned away. Oh, Tricky. my God. That absolute the flick by. And then he acts as if, well, it's no big deal. This happens every day of the week. It was his only option. Uh, not to yeah, take that away was, that's from what the we back That's what we were saying before. Wait, what? It you're was not... his only option. Well, it was the only option for a player of that creativity. Well, it was either. It was in Mark the back. Mark Bastin's only option was to do what yeah, he did to look. score the goal. No, that's... Back to go, what's he going to do here? Come back? Well, he oh, couldn't. That's beautiful. Yeah, I feel oh, like, like he, he, beautiful. he couldn't pick the ball up. And, well, a million, a million out of a million players picked that ball up stupidly and are like, yeah, oh, yeah, I know what that's what I mean. Like, it's 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 it was intelligent play. But but that's the beauty of Gaelic football. You can play another sport within the sport. It's totally fine. It's true. It's you great. Like, I think you need to have a soccer brain in order to pull it off in Gaelic as well. It is. It is a truism of Gaelic football life that anybody who says a penalty in these three or four weeks, ah, oh, you wouldn't see the like of it in the World Cup. And Conor Glass, when he was asked on TG Carr about the uh, the through ball for the goal that eventually seals the deal, he's like, oh. Yeah, yeah, did he say you wouldn't see the life in the World Cup or were we even watching too much World Cup because that's what Potty Clifford goes I've been watching too much World Cup when he was asked about um, I hope yeah. the same old interviews Yeah, that's fair it, but I mean and the GA of course clashing with the World Cup at the weekend but I think the GA club came out smelling the roses as well and it was a very 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 good World Cup weekend but we're still talking about the GA first so it's just you, uh, it's you, fine you had a good weekend too Shane by the sounds of it you know what uh, hey, I'm going to uh, play him you're going, you're going full Monaghan on this morning, are you? I'm gonna, I'm gonna blame Harry Kane's penalty miss because my, my, obviously not because I wasn't celebrating the moment. I was just reacting to a great World Cup moment, uh, intensity. So my voice, um, not being gone is probably down to the the Spurs and England striker. So he's to blame. Here's what's coming up between now and ten o'clock this morning. You can read into that what you want. I'm not, I'm not going to interpret it for you. Uh, performance rankings going to do them straight away. Daniel Harris going to give us a view from England at five past eight. We've got sports pages, busy day for them. Alan Quinnan is going to join us. Disappointment for Munster and Ulster. Leinster were pretty good. Connacht's B team were excellent. Gavin Comiskey is in Qatar. He's going to give us his experience so far, and then we play out with some Philippe Auclair goodness at uh, half past nine this morning. But your comments are going to make it, I think. Um, Marty Collett says he was in the three arena and it, uh, the place sounded like there was 100,000 people there when the England result came through. Yeah, it was in, um, I was in a pub in Monaghan Town as well and perhaps unsurprisingly uh, packed and yeah, the biggest cheer of the night was definitely when the, when the second penalty was missed. Uh, random people hugging each other. Beers not quite flying in the air like box I, box. I Wembley, definitely but wanted to see what happens in extra time. Did you not all want yeah, to Yeah, there, there, like that, there was that element to it of course. I wouldn't have been disappointed if it, if, it, if it had been scored and we got an extra 30 minutes of that because I was enjoying yeah, it. Yeah. Um, High end good stuff. Anyway, seven thirty four OTBAM. Get us on YouTube. Uh, tweet us with the hashtag OTBAM. Time for the Gillette Labs performance rankings. You know that wasn't an All Ireland winning performance. Probably should have won the game based on the second half performance. Is it a step too far to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup? Maybe not. OTBAM's performance rankings with Gillette. I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. That performance is was just lacked that intensity. Boom. Where are we going? We will start in the red. Um, and Ronaldo and Neymar being uh, finished I think is the, the correct term dead end for superstars uh, we might as well start with Neymar uh, cause since that uh, that game was on first wasn't it the, the, the whole weekend seems like a blur because of the, the order of the matches but uh, Neymar not having the uh, I guess the leadership to step up and take his penalty first um, he already had scored a penalty in this World Cup he is the Brazil penalty taker he's taken more career penalties combined than the rest of the entire Brazil squad and yet when it comes to a shootout, he doesn't do a Messi. Messi stands up first and takes penalty for Argentina. Uh, he does what you see some other superstars doing as well. Ronaldo and Salah are guilty of this as well, lads. You know, lining themselves up for the fifth penalty, wanting the headlines, steal the moment. They know that's the penalty that's going to stick in people's heads the most. 
historically speaking, if it is the winning penalty. But the odds of it being the winning penalty, I think Neymar potentially owes an apology to Rodrigo and to Marquinhos, the two players who missed for Brazil in that shootout against Croatia. Um, put them in an awkward position. No, he, he no they've got a score. They've got a score. Well, They're Brazil. Course. They've got a score. They can't be like I think. Well, I. Uh, I mean, I do think his goal was absolutely sensational. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, I think it was Owen Kowser tweeted. That's the the problem with Neymar is that ninety nine times out of hundred he goes down in that scenario and looks for the penalty, but he can do that. Huh. I, I, like uh, I thought, it was, I thought it was his legacy World Cup moment. This is it. This is the bit, and it should have been like. It, the, the, this game should never have gone to penalties. Shoulda, woulda, coulda. At all. Yes, but this was a Brazil team who had the, had the game won, had done everything they need to do against a very dangerous, tricky opponent. And for whatever reason, they're like, oh, let's just play it around like it's a training game with three and a half le- minutes left to go. Uh, it was idiotic. That bit was idiotic. Penalties, I know. Like, ah, come on. Someone's got to take the fifth. You want your best? No, you at, want your best taken first. You're the leader the end, of the team. You have to end. take first. But it's actually not that hard. They've been practicing for years. They know what the story is. Yeah, but Neymar is Neymar They're is like the best high end World Cup footballers. He's the best penalty taker on that team by by probably by far in yeah, terms of experience taking penalties as well. Uh, certainly, in, in, in experience terms, like you have to go first, second, or third if you're the best penalty taker because that means you're guaranteed a kick. I mean, to go fourth or fifth, fifth especially is to go fifth in particular. We don't know what order uh, Neymar might have been, but like I mean. It, that was that was ego driven, one hundred percent. When you see Ronaldo doing it, when you see Salah doing it, it's always ego driven. It's also the most pressurized kick. You know, at the end of it, you're like, lads, these, these are the, there's no pressure on you. I'm gonna I'm gonna take all the pressure. I I like look. Someone has to take the fifth penalty. First penalty you, sets the tone. That, you've, that's you've the got, pressure kick. You've got David O'Leary standing over. You're like, oh no, how did this happen? It's like, hardly it's hardly the pressure kick if you don't get to the fifth penalty. You don't even have to take it. Well, you're like, oh, I can bow out here because you expect the rest of the chumps not to miss. I do think I do think that the goal is going to get lost in the annals of this World Cup, and that's one of the reasons why this is now turning into. I mean, uh, it was it was predicted last week in that very seat column that this has been a great World Cup, one of the best since we've been alive. Mm-hmm. It has now catapulted itself into the realms of all time great World Cups. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, those four quarterfinals were absolutely just, just incredible. Like, I mean, like the Brazil Croatia at this point was just an appetizer, and I thought. Oh, this will be the moment of the weekend. <laughs> Neymar's all-time goal that was going to finally catapult him into the true greats of the game for all the talent that he has. There's always a bit of a feeling that he's a bit of a waster, like that he could have done so much more with himself, even though he's by rights, you know, in the point zero 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 one percent top successful footballers of all time, there is still a feeling that oh, you could be so much more. And he did it against Croatia and it was like, oh yeah, they're going to fall apart here, the Croatians. They're not the team they were four years ago when they reached the final. And then just this incredible side, like with the psyche of, mentality monsters that Jurgen Klopp talks about all the time is that they just do not go away and like in the build up to their equaliser you know Emma mentioned it in our pre-show meeting just Modric's turn and through ball and it was like well they have that little bit of sprinkle mm-hmm. of quality but really what they have is resolve and then as they approach the box for the equaliser it's like you know they have a chance here just swing that boot at it and that deflection of Marcanos and then uh, Alisson was just you know his face just the, the crushing blow of his face he realises I'm not going to get to this and then when I got the penalties I'm like genuinely I'm thinking uh, like Croatia they, they could win this and do you know why because Rodrigo went first for Brazil and I was like this guy doesn't want to be there he has he, to take a first name or doesn't he he does not want to be there this no, guy no. he's going to miss this penalty Terrifying he does look. not want to so Neymar's his hero right Rodrigo looks up to Neymar Look, and like from a distance they were exact same footwear as well and they have the same running style so it's like they're so so similar looking mm. when he came on and then uh, when he runs up takes the penalty he this massive run up and I was like he, he's going to put this he's going to put it right He's got like all his body language is going to the right, and the keeper knows this, and he doesn't want to be there. Whatever the opposite of leadership is, that's what Neymar, uh, that's what Neymar showed in that penalty shootout. Like you have to put your hand up in the group before you take it, before the penalty shootout starts and say, "I'm up first. You don't you don't ask, you don't you don't suggest. You well, they demand. must have talked about it beforehand. Somebody somewhere, like whatever about the penalties, right? Like the game was there for them. They were the better side, clearly. Yeah. And they they couldn't get it done, and it's a it's a, a very like there was a, a a long period when we were kids growing up from the the essentially the eighty six World Cup, the eighty two World Cup. You're like okay, that's a bit strange that they got beaten like that. I I don't remember that, but the eighty six World Cup they go out in penalties, and then from that point forward until they win the penalty shootout in the cup final in the World Cup final in ninety four. There's this kind of sense of there's a flakiness within Brazilian football, mm. and then the rest of the teams come along after that, and, and the dam bursts and they. 
they harvest World Cups for a while, but they, there seems to be a flakiness in them. Well, there was the feeling when they went one up that they had won it. They, they were playing like they had won it. Um, they, their intensity dropped significantly, and I thought, I think they thought, well, Croatia don't have much going forward, like so. As long as we control possession, we're fine here. But they were playing like they were two or three up when it was one. Yeah. And uh, Croatia saw that, and they went one last chance, and they got it. But look, for Neymar not taking the penalty. Uh, it's good that that happened because then we saw Marquinhos' penalty with the drama of that. It's one of the all-time great World Cup moments, the clang of the post, mm -hmm. the split-second delay in his reaction where he's like, oh my God, I just missed, and the falling to the knees. Like, that is the World Cup montage sewn up when it's all said and done. That's going to be played to some dramatic opera music because that was beautiful. It was like, because it was, you know, I would say again, a well-struck penalty, low and hard. Nope. Smacks the post and it's the and it comes through so Obviously well missed. on the mics. There's nothing so, well so struck. Well. There's nothing well struck about a penalty. It like comes through so well on the microphones. If anything, if anything, he struck it too well, Shane. Crushing Jesus, disappointment. Yeah. The crushing disappointment. Are there any awards for, it, for hitting the ball well? Yeah, and exactly. the post? Special prize. Uh, a yeah, he prize. did everything. He did everything right. No, he did, did, the target. did nothing right. So what about Ronaldo? Uh, Ronaldo, sorry, can I just point out Kevin Sheedy took the first penalty for Ireland in the title in the Romania penalty shootout. He can strike a ball well. He stood up as a leader. No one remembers that penalty. But he knew that he could score it. Everyone talks about David Leary going fifth grand. But Kevin Sheedy had the cojones to step up and say, I can hit penalties well, I'm going first. Name well, you have respect learn. for people who go first. And the other four plus penalty takers for you are chumps. Uh, I think I, that's I, leadership there, think, stepping up first. I think this is all a bit of a red herring, to be honest. Fair, but uh, yeah, it's, it's not the point. But look, Neymar said he was psychologically destroyed after the game. I think he was psychologically destroyed before the shootout even started. But he just, he just had his World Cup moment. Yeah. That was his Maradona moment. He should have been in good form then, ready to take the penalty. But anyway, you want to move on to Ronaldo. I think we should. Ronaldo, another man uh, who makes it all about himself. Walking down the tunnel in tears as the rest of his Portugal teammates uh, congratulated their, their opponents on a good victory. Walked around the stadium thanking the Portuguese fans for being there. Uh, while Ronaldo... Um, look, I'm not going to blame him for the tears because it's probably his last, it is his last World Cup, let's be honest. He'll be 41 by the time the next one rolls around. Uh, but you'd never rule him out. But, I mean, he made it all about himself. Uh, he came off the bench, had no impact on the game, had one, I suppose, reasonably good chance that Bono saved from Morocco. Like, and to be fair, Gonzalo Ramos, who scored the hat-trick during the week, was fairly irrelevant against Morocco as well. Portugal generally just weren't good. Um, and Ronaldo again. I know we shouldn't probably be talking about Ronaldo, but I guess uh, I think the Ronaldo-Messi argument is now finished. We've 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 all agreed, haven't we? That that there's no point even talking about it anymore because uh, Messi's shown a number of times leadership steps up. Um, now Messi's not perfect in, off the pitch in terms of his Saudi tourism stuff and the Qatari money, but uh, in terms of on pitch at this World Cup, there's been a gulf there. And uh, I think Ronaldo just made it all about himself. He came out with this big statement on Instagram after the match and pointing out that I never, you know, all these rumours about him falling out with Fernando Santos and. You know, stepping away from the team and being angry at not getting playing. He denied all that, but um, it's hard to deny that when he came off the bench, he had no impact. And then uh, the tears at the end were, were, I guess, the iconic image of this World Cup for Ronaldo fans. Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's very necessary to talk about him this morning because, in theory, lads, this is the last time we'll ever really see him on a prominent stage, ever. This yeah. could be it for him, you know. He could play his club football in a, in a lower quality league and he'll rack up the goals and we'll hear about and I'm sure the goals will be seen online and he'll probably score a screamer here or there and then I think we'll be reflecting on in a few years time it's like God almighty his demise was so rapid in that last year because in his last full season at top level football he scored 24 goals in all competitions for Manchester United and was at, at times the shining light in a very poor season and then the next season onwards he's just, he scored that goal he scored against Ghana that penalty was his fourth goal uh, in all competitions and teams this season, the other goals like two against Sheriff in the Europa League and one against Everton, which was a good goal at Goodison Park, and that was his last for United. And then he scores that one penalty against Ghana, and then he leaves the World Cup if he doesn't play again, having never scored in a knockout stages. But yet, he's the first man to score in five World Cups, so he still has that legacy. He'll be happy with that. Ah, look, his, uh, his, his, his legacy uh, is going to be an incredible footballer, of course, but the not, way a, not a great human being that everybody can aspire mm. to, to. You know, that's so many of our. Great footballers are, uh, but there's a real possibility that this is uh, this is it, that we're never really going to see Ronaldo again properly. That's you all know, right. That could be it. He's he's had a good innings. Of course he has, but this time to he's get been out around the stage since um, someone 2003. Else's, someone else's go. Yeah, he's part of people's um, upbringing. You know, 
he's a huge part of it and that's it that's probably going to be the way it ends with him um, crying down the tunnel and being escorted away as someone tweeted like um, when I was young in Asda I lost my mum the shame of it being escorted away and that's you, how Ronaldo um, finished his career the 4k camera following, following down the tunnel uh, was a bit insidious but I mean still you, you feel emotional well yeah I think um because it is the end of an era. Like I've just realised that this is actually this is a this moment is it, yeah. for you, yeah. Because I like this happens. People move on, you know. Yeah, no, I know. I'm under, I understand how time works, but yeah. I'm just saying it's um, you know, it is the end, really. Like that's the last we're going to see of him. And I look for it's been a long time now since I loved him because that was really in the noughties. As Shane has already alluded to himself, we all know Shane's been on Ronaldo at this stage. He's sick to death of him, but Shane still appreciates the old street, the old nine era of Ronaldo. But I think he's just you know one of the greatest players of all time. He's going to kind of uh, fade out now. As, as but ra- rather than the Zidane or Cantona go out with a bang, he's just going to fade away because he's going to want to score as many goals as humanly possible before mm. he stops having the ability to kick a football. So that could go on to his early 40s. We may not see him unless, unless someone sees fit to redeem this guy's career to top level. Someone um, could do that. I could see him playing a couple of seasons in the championship with somebody trying to... Because there'll be goals and there'll be money and there'll be English... And there'll uh, be the English championship? Like... <laughs> like Jack, come on. Well, uh, so, I was listening to Rob McElhenney the other day, right, doing a, an interview about... You can join Wrexham, bring them from the National League North. Seasons, there. seasons three and four have not yet been renewed. What would happen? But like, it's just some, some kind of revenue share. The, the money is insane. No. I mean, is that a serious suggestion or... I don't know. Nothing's you're just testing if me and Colm are awake on this Monday morning so far. Colm's not, so you keep going there. Go on. <laughs> so, uh, Ronaldo's in the red. Ronaldo's in the red. Will we move on from the red? I do think that, like, um, if Pepe just hits the target, like, Portugal had many, 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 many chances. They did. They should have, like, they should have fair played. play to Morocco, but, like, yeah. I think uh, Portugal will be sickened that this is the chance for them to win the World Cup. What are they doing? What are you doing? Yeah, it was, a, it was an open goal. Like, it was there for the taking. We saw the performance in the last 16 game, and you're thinking, this Portugal team are, are brilliant. Just batting away a Swiss team that, that everyone knows is a good knockout team. But I don't know. I, I, I think the writing was on the, on the wall as soon as Ronaldo was coming on. He looked very focused coming off the bench. And, and look. Some one, goal. It was some, it was some goal. It was like supreme athleticism from Morocco. Like it was Jordan-esque getting up there and still being able to... Yeah, so it was much. game management from then. But, but um, the Portuguese goalkeeper also, no good. No good. Yeah, they, look, they had a number of fellas who didn't step up uh, at the weekend. But, I mean, you can't take it away from Morocco. But, I mean, the Ronaldo tears is what we'll all... And that's what makes the back pages, that sort of stuff. But Ronaldo knows that. He knows that there's a little... You know, he'll still be in the headlines. I don't think uh, I don't. Th- I don't think he'll ever play in England again. Uh, I don't think any club in England would have him. I mean, you're not, you're not seriously suggesting he'd be lining out for Blackburn Rovers next year, Jer, in, in the Championship. Are you? I do think that he could... Continue to play to these 40, 41, 42, right? Yeah. Like, and there's a level that you're like, well, I play in the MLS. Yeah, I probably will play in the MLS. But like, there's also enough money in some of those places. There's a, there's a good chance that some rich American owner looks at what Wrexham are doing and thinks, well, I'll just like skip six years and the TV part of it mm. and buy a team in the championship. And then Ronaldo could easily end up playing in the championship. That's no. like his ego. His ego is far too big for that. But if you're if if you're in front of a crowd of thirty five thousand week in week out because you've you've signed Ronaldo when he's forty one and he's scoring thirty seven goals and you oh, get promoted. But his ego would only allow him to play at the and top, you're top him, teams. You're giving him two hundred grand a week. His ego his ego's broken now. Where is he? Get, he's going to Saudi Arabia. Yeah, but that, that that's that, that's for the money. I mean, he's like, yeah, right, it's either ego, it's either footballing ego or money. And all right, okay. The Saudi money is just. Well, more look, you already have Rory on to hear about the Blackburn show. Today. That's why I picked. That's why yeah, I picked. I knew you picked that for Rory. Yeah, 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 he's not happy with that at all. Um, <laughs> look, he could he could very well he could very well be back in European football again a few years time. Someone's going to take a chance at him. Someone will need some goals. Probably a like a nice. Sam Allardyce style January emergency signing. He could well be back, but I don't think he will be. I think that's it. And I think uh, this is the bookmark in Cristiano Ronaldo's career. It was the Nadir against Morocco where he wasn't really effective when he came on. Mm. Was he, he, he completed five passes, three of them were intercepted. That was his uh, impact from 51 minutes onwards. Pretty poor. That's it. Yeah. Well, look, Ronaldo finished at international level. Well, he, look, he could come back and win the Euros in a couple of years' time in Germany. Not saying it's going to happen, but uh, you never know with Ronaldo. Uh, and then Neymar, um, the coward that is, that wouldn't take the first penalty. So that's uh, in the red. We'll move on to the next one. Ulster and Munster. Um, slightly in the red, although we might start with Munster because although they lost to Toulouse, you'd have to say 
there are bright shoots there. Um, now, for anyone who watched the game, you probably would have done well to have seen the game because the fog, I mean, there was great images of uh, Keith Wood alongside Tommy Rooney on reports for Off the Ball at the weekend and I uh, was watching the video of Keith afterwards and to say he was wrapped up well would be an understatement. I mean, the scarf, the hat, it was absolutely Baltic looking down there on, uh, on the weekend. Um, Antoine Dupont, inspiring to lose to the win, you'd have to say. Um, so the second half, the fog starts getting heavier, the play starts getting a bit scrappier. But I mean, Munster, Joey Carberry was brilliant. This is the Carberry we want to see starting in the Six Nations, lads, isn't it? This is the, I, I don't know where you all stand on that particular point, but there was only five points separating these two teams late on. Um, and you kind of were thinking Munster are going to push on here, potentially find a winner. Uh, couldn't quite do it, but you'd have to look at the, the game now this Friday. So they're visiting Northampton Saints. It's probably the perfect team to play. Like, hammered at La Rochelle at the weekend. Northampton. So you're thinking, if Munster can get this back on track and try and get out of this group, then they're going to have to get a win this Friday night. So it's it's kind of come at them fast. If you lose your opening pool game in the, in the Heineken Champions Cup, uh, it's fairly difficult for you to push on from there. Um, but I think if you're a Munster fan this morning, you're fairly encouraged because even before this game, three-game winning streak, that includes the South Africa game, of course, against the South Africa Select. Um, but there were plenty and plenty of positives and Graham Rountree will be fairly pleased uh, starting strongly, they were aggressive, they had intensity in, uh, in the ruck as well. I don't know. Uh, regardless of, the, of the, the five point defeat, lads, I think if you're a Munster fan this morning, you're thinking, ah, oh, that was all right. More fog than in the movie, The Fog, says Mark C in the YouTube comments. In fairness, it was pretty foggy. It was absolutely, it was insane at one point. <laughs> Craig Doyle at the end was like, ah, oh, I hope you enjoy that second half. I didn't see much of it. No. <laughs> when, the, when the TV broadcaster was telling you, I didn't know I didn't watch it. Something mm. happened, I couldn't, I couldn't see. It was uh, tricky. I don't know if Munster, I don't like, you can't be happy. You've got to be happy that some progress is being made, but like, it's a long, slow road to get to where they want to get to. If now all of a sudden it's okay to be beaten at home. Uh, you know but it's I mean? in the context of where, yeah. context of where they are. So yeah, that, yeah. Like, three okay. defeat, or three wins before that, yeah. South Africa, Connick, context uh, of where they are. Is the Edinburgh, thing. not so bad, but then to lose to the multiple time champions, top of top 14, you know, it's like, okay, <laughs> alright, this is the reasonable. But even even under Johan van Grand, they managed to draw the game last year and, and take it to penalty Remember kicks. Johan van Grand, so, yeah, that's where they are. But like, last year, they did better when they had a, an inferior coach. Considering the start, yeah, but under round three, they've been like so inconsistent to start with had that mini decent run. So I think it wasn't like there was a mutiny at home and they, I think they, they put the conditions of the mind and the opposition into the factor that, all right, this is probably where they are at the moment. Five point defeat, one score. You have to remember the 22. So first happy, game. You're happy. Not happy. I'm you're, saying you're, it's, you're, it's, uh, it's a, a reasonable, uh, reasonably acceptable defeat. I you? mean, we live in this age now where every time your team loses that it's an absolute outrage and like just straight into the rate of ah, performance rankings. Like just like this. Spare me that old man shedding. Well, you have to assess like, performance as well, Jer, for sure. Yeah. I mean, and I thought, I thought in the first half, <laughs> I thought in the first half, they were creating chances and, they, and there was a period in that first 20 minutes where they were dominant and they got one try and uh, Toulouse got one opportunity and they and scored. On. Yeah. Look, Toulouse are an excellent side, right? But Munster don't have that killer dog just yet and we need to see more of that. And I I just, it's great that the, the patterns of play are emerging, mm. but when, when does the killer instinct emerge? When do we start seeing them benefiting <laughs> from good play? Yeah, um, maybe it's not this year at all. I don't know. Maybe, and maybe that's what the expe uh, expectation is. And they almost feel like they're going through the rebuilding phase still. And that that you, you need to give them some credit for that. I mean, they're not going to be the end product straight away. I felt like a couple of years ago when Toulouse beat Munster behind closed doors during the COVID era. I was thinking, oh, before the game of the weekend, I was thinking, well, the fans are there now. There's twenty two thousand odd fans turning up in Thomond Park during the fog and the cold. I thought that's going to maybe push them over the line here. The concern is that they couldn't towards the end. When they get within five points and you're thinking, can they push on here? I know Carberry missed the kick in the first half, for example. It would have been tighter than, than it uh, was in the end. But I don't know. I, there, there were definite positives to take. You, ha you have to look at the positive. I, the concerning thing for me, I said the fact that they have three, three games left. Northampton Saints on Friday. They have to lose away in January. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, the wor that's the worry for me. Tricky. That's a pretty tricky game. So, ah, yeah. Gone so, are the days of months losing at home where it's absolutely seismic news and it leads the news agenda. That's probably the yeah. biggest reason that it's it's sad demise. But still, in the context of where they are, it's not so bad. But your beloved Ulster, ah, here. they got a hammering. Sorry, but I mean, I don't know I don't know if anyone expected 
that result, 39 points. It's during the now. season that they've had. Yeah, yeah. I, I was uh, fairly shocked. Now, if you look at the, the men they didn't have involved, Ian Henderson, John Cooney, Rob Balakoon, um not to mind the travel chaos that they had as well. So they had the, the flights cancelled. They were at the airport the day before um, and sitting at the airport, flights postponed, pushed back a number of times. They eventually gave up, came back the next day. They were only on the plane six hours before the game kicked off in sail, which uh, isn't the ideal preparation for Ulster. Look, they're a well-conditioned professional outfit, so blaming the travel chaos for the result would be a bit stupid, but it's still not, a, not an ideal preparation when you're getting an airplane six hours before you, you play a Heineken Champions Cup game. Still embarrassing. I, I don't, yeah. you know, um, fair enough, right? You, you Put the excuses out there. Sorry, I've got them out of the way. Yeah, a really embarrassing performance from Ulster, like uh, cataclysmic in terms of where they thought they were versus last season when, you know, they were incredibly unlucky and they were very, very exciting. And even when, uh, you know, it was, was it 27 uh, nil with like 15 minutes left to go, basically, it was like mm. 13 minutes left to go. And instead of them being the ones who scored a couple of tries to, you know, uh, take some of the bad luck off or show that actually we've showed up here today, you know, work their way in, get past that, they completely fell apart. Yeah. It, like, and to put this into context as to how rarely this happens for Ulster, nilled for the first time ever in European competition. And it's the first time they've been held without a single point in any competition in 14 years. Really, really embarrassing. Like, really, really fundamentally embarrassing for Ulster. And because we, we, we thought that they had made so much progress. Like, it looks like they have strength and depth, notwithstanding the fact that they're missing those players. Like, you know, the players who were replacing those players are all very good players. Yeah, and, but the cons- yeah, a hundred percent. But the, the concern for me was that they couldn't even they couldn't even have a, a anything resembling a spell of possession. Like they couldn't, they literally couldn't keep the ball. Never. Like the, the defense was clearly porous, uh, and any time Sale got the ball, you, you thought this is going to be a try. But the the really worrying for Ulster thing for Ulster would possibly be that this could have been worse. Like it was thirty nine points to nil, and I'm sitting here on the Monday morning going that could have been worse for Ulster. Um, they just had nothing to offer, absolutely nothing to offer. I'm not saying there's any, going to be any pressure whatsoever necessarily on Dan McFarlane. This is look, the first game of the Champions Cup, there's still time to recover. Um, but you look at the games, so Ulster have La Rochelle in Belfast next Saturday. Big game. I mean, all of a sudden it takes on cataclysmic proportions, that match. All of a sudden you're looking at that game going, well, if Ulster were to lose again and to lose... Not quite as embarrassingly, but they're at home. So even to lose by you know, 10, 12 points to La Rochelle next weekend, all of a sudden the pressure coming on the management is fierce. And it shows how quickly rugby can come at you because you mentioned it, Colin, like, they've been good this season. Mm-hmm. Like, I haven't, uh, any Ulster fan would have enjoyed watching them playing so far, but uh, the, game on, the game on the weekend was just um, very, very, very concerning. All right. So I don't know where they go. That's it. They're in the red. Well, let's, they, let's keep going. They deserve it. So we'll, we'll bring the amber in. Uh, but Quinny coming up a little bit later on so if you're watching this on YouTube go and uh, see what Quinny has to say uh, or subscribe to the OTB Rugby feed wherever you get your podcasts England in the amber uh, and the way Colm you pitched this to me last night was bottlers or valiant what is wrong with you <laughs> this is the question how are they in the amber well, where do you think the difference is how is? are they in the amber what, 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 what bit of this is like oh you're in the amber oh well done they played well um, Sunday night how did, how did Denmark do Sunday against? night WhatsApp uh, did, reconstruction Ger, I was thinking there uh, we should put England in the amber because like it's actually up for debate careful was now. that a disgrace or was this uh, was it valiant and you were like oh that's a great idea <laughs> yeah because it allows us to talk about how nonsensical so they're, you they're, think they're, 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 you just wanted to throw shots if you go out in the World Cup quarter final when you've got the chance to win the game it's a it's a sporting disaster, right? Like we we can all yeah. accept it. It's not really a disaster, but it's a yeah. disaster from an English football perspective because it's a World Cup that's right there for the winning. You just listed off all the players that Ulster are missing. Yeah, the players that France are missing include the Ballon d'Or winner, the best centre midfielder that Europe has had over the last ten years, Paul Pogba, who they managed to turn into somebody, and a bunch of other players, including their first choice left back. The second choice left back seems, turns out pretty good, you know. Yeah, like with all due respect. When you have them on the rack, you have to win. Otherwise, there's something wrong. This is your golden generation. In four years' time, they'll still be really young. It'll be great. You haven't a clue what's going to happen in four years' time. You don't know that every player is going to go in a straight line and continue to be successful. The four years ago, everybody would have said, in four years' time, Jack Grealish is going to be great. He'll be at the peak of his powers. Can't get in the team. Can't get in the team. 
Like the notion that this is like, oh, England are building towards something. It's we're we're right there. No, you had the moment. You had the World Cup champions on the rack, and you could do nothing with it. Mm. You could do. You didn't know what to do. You were like, oh, we're creating chances here, or we're having pot shots from distance. Like it's just, and the the fallout has been. We were the best team in the tournament. I'm watching the French go, and they've given um, who was it? They give Declan Rice the Thibaut Courtois Award on uh, French social media because it's like oh apart from the goals we were the better team it's like yeah hilarious the French are laughing they are laughing because they know at the end the only thing that matters is what the score on the scoreboard says the only right sorry the notion that England are in how the did app. Denmark do against France great for 15 minutes they were brilliant and how did how did Denmark's World Cup go oh shite that's what it is and the Danes are sitting around going well we were brilliant for 15 minutes against the French can I remind you that this is the Gillette Lab performance rankings, not results rankings. Okay. Fair point. Fair point. They played, I thought, quite well. The game really could have gone either way. It pains me. I would love to say, oh, they battled it and France were way better than them. But like, we could have the exact same conversation about France if England had taken their chances versus France chances, which weren't much better. It was an extremely even game. I thought, France, I thought France were much better in the first half. I thought England were sensational in the second half. I thought they played really, really well. Very good. Uh, and now, when Harry Kane stood up for this penalty, we've all discussed this pre-show, and I've had it all over a weekend, where were you for the Harry Kane penalty already as a where were you moment? And Kathleen was saying she was in a pub in Dublin. She said it was the loudest cheer she's ever heard. And she's been at that pub for other games, including Ireland. And it was still the loudest cheer she's ever heard. We have the picture on screen. Like, where's the ball? Where's the ball? It. You can't see him in the, the white of the England uh, the fans in the oh, jerseys. Oh, it's just over the crossbar. Just, I see it there, uh, yeah. touching the crossbar. And it goes miles over. We saw Johnny Wilkinson. Still yeah. don't know. Uh, the pub I was in also went absolutely bloobers mm. when he put it over. And I was delighted because I, had, uh, I was supposed to go for dinner at nine, right? And I was like, this is an 84th minute penalty. It was like, first of all, Harry King's going to score this penalty. Like, there's no doubt about that in my mind. It's like, I'm going to be on my phone during dinner watching extra time, just like I was for the previous 24 hours Netherlands against Argentina, which was like the greatest World Cup game ever. Um, and I was like, oh, no, I'm going to miss it. So I was so happy for many reasons that he put it over. Then I woke up Sunday morning and the most common WhatsApp video I was sent was Harry Kane with a video with Johnny Wilkinson from the 2018 comic relief on BBC. I couldn't believe I that believe was four years it. ago. I believe we have it. Here, Here we go. go. So uh, I'd say everyone's seen this, lads, have they, by now? Because there's like billions, billions of views it is. You, you can explain what's happening. So Kane's taking a penalty. John no, Bishop, the no, comedian's no. overseeing that he's coaching in the virtual yeah. comments. Johnny Wilkinson <laughs> Let me show and you. Harry Kane and uh, their respective sports. They're using a football here, saying penalties. Wilkinson saying, no, 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 Harry, that's not how you do it. Harry's just scored a penalty, put in the goal. Wilkinson steps up for his penalty, puts it miles over the bar. Harry Kane's like, but you put it way over. And he was like, yeah, yeah, that's how you do it. That's how you do it in my sport. He's like, okay. Harry's like, yeah, okay, okay. I'll try World that Cup myself. <laughs> That's how it's I a won a World Cup with England. Okay. You talked over the, the good line there, Colm. Go ahead, do it again. Take two. Yes. That's what he does there, Harry Kane. Yes. Harry, much better. That's the one. I good. mean, look. It's good. We love it. We do love it, let's be honest. The, the Monaghan pub I was in was very sad and emotional, as you can imagine, at that moment. Um, a lot of sympathy for Harry Kane in the pub. Um, it was upsetting. It was very upsetting to see him sad. Um, they missed it. They missed what? They missed your line. What was the line? That's how you win the World Cup. They didn't miss it. I think they did. They missed it when, when <laughs> Johnny Wilkinson <laughs> said it. That's how you lose the World Cup. Um, look, they're in the amber because there are positive shoots here. Do you think it was in his head? Of course it was in his head. That, uh, Johnny that, that shoot? Oh, no, sorry, that there, that there moment? No, no, not at all. The brain is very complex. It's a very, yeah, very yeah. complex organism. What was in his head was, if I score this penalty, I'm England's leading goal scorer of all yeah, time. Yeah, that's another point. That, that's a big, big thing. He was level in running 53 goals. Didn't Lineker miss the penalty that would have made him? I'm fairly sure that Lineker missed the penalty that would have made him the outright To scorer. do it at a World Cup, Harry. Oh, to that do it at a World Cup. I would say more so it's my club teammate and he's he's thinking, uh, Hugo's thinking I'm going to do the same thing here. And he, by the looks of it, went for the exact same thing. Second time around, Apparently, and he got too much on it. Larry, no, I don't think he went for the same thing. It, it was. I think he was aiming for the same corner, Kane. But it's too, too. It was middle too left. Down the middle. I th I think that's what he was. I was going to. No, it was. Right it was. Yeah, I think he was going left, left again. Yeah. I think he was going left, and he well, just put way too much on it. Well, then he completely <laughs> duffed it. Yeah, he's just screwed <laughs> he it. That's, that's, like, what he, no. that's what he was trying to do. Uh, I, think I think it was. I've heard it actually mentioned to me that um, Kane shouldn't have taken the second penalty, and I was like, that's a ridiculous notion. Apparently, eighty-three percent of players score the second when they've when they've hit the first. If you do get two penalties in a match, I was never more convinced that someone was scoring a penalty. I was I was genuinely a little yeah. bit shocked when it went over. I do think that um, 
you know, Jamie Carragher, oh, this is great, we're doing, everything's going great, we're all amazing. Like, it feels a little bit like how, I remember after the the Euros when we reached the last 16 and we were 1-0 up against the French, I remember thinking, oh, this is a bright new day for the Republic of Ireland. Look at that midfield trio just coming into the peak of their careers. James McCarthy, uh, who else was there? Robbie, and who, 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 who was there, three? What? Who was there, who was there, three? Um, Carthy, Robbie Brady, Jeff Hendrick. Jeff Hendrick. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just absolutely peak oh, of yeah, powers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is going to be four years of greatness from Ireland. And England are like, yeah, we're, we're going to be great. We're just not today. England are going to be great. We can't be great today. They're not. They are going to be great. They are, England, are, they have such a good squad. They have uh, such yeah. a good squad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All, the, all the great teams it's have great squads. only two years' time. Sure, Jude's only 19. You think they're going to win the Euros in Germany? I don't. I, Spare I, 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 I never. Spare I, I never. I'm never Today confident they're going to. I'm never confident they're going to win anything. The but I'm just saying that they have a great squad. Well then, well then, what's your point? That they have a great squad. You're like, oh, that's it for them. You're kind of intimating the fact that this is it. There's, isn't it? There is something wrong. How are we only on amber? It's five past eight. There's something wrong. If you can't get through these games where you're like you're the better team, there's something wrong. And and look, maybe Tuchel is the person they're talking about taking the job. Although the Telegraph are like, are we ready for a German or are we ready for a Northern Irishman? Will the No Surrender Brigade accept an... Uh, uh, I'm like, what? Yeah. How is that even an issue? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Look, well, I'm sure Daniel Harris will say more about it, but apparently the FA want Southgate to stay and yeah. Southgate's seriously considering his future because he's had a tough last 18 months, as he alluded to. Since the penalties against Italy, 4-0 in the deer at home to Hungary in Wolves when he was destroyed by the crowd. And he hasn't forgot that. He brought that up. He, he saved that. Yeah, My point up. is that there's no guarantee that because you play well in a World Cup quarterfinal that all of a sudden of that, that you're going to somehow find that everybody else stops getting better at the same time and you're the only team who progresses and therefore it's going to be relatively straightforward for you. It's not. That was it. There's absolutely no guarantees. They came up against yeah. a, a French side, critically weakened, who played badly and they still lost. That could great, be it. A great squad and they got two penalties. That could, be, that could be it. That could be the height of where they go. That's but at the same point, time, it it's only, But it's only two years away. The Euros are only two years away. But whatever so the a lot of their core players will get better with clubs in the next two years. Maybe, they should be better. Maybe. But there's no guarantees. But exactly, they should be. Exactly. I, my, my prediction so is that they're going to get they're better. They're in the red. You blew the chance to they're win the World Amber. Cup. They, they should have been in the red. Very well. I don't think there's much more they could do. Amber could suggests you're progressing towards green. They are Jude Bellingham. Jude that's Bellingham exactly my point Amber. is that they're progressing towards green. That's exactly my point. How did point. they do in the last World Cup? The last World Cup? Semi-finals. Semi-finals. How did they do in this World Cup? Quarter final. Is that progress? Who did they play? Who did they play? Beep, who did they play? Beep, beep, who did they play in the 2018 World Cup? Who did they play? Was a good impersonation of a dump truck. Who did they play? They just played a French side who are critically weakened. The French side who've looked the, the, the best last, team in the tournament. The last team... Have they? I would say they've looked the best team. Oh, in the tournament. Sorry, I, England were the best team in the tournament according to some of the stuff that I've read. Was that Carragher as well? Probably. So it's your uh, narrative, as the fella says, because uh, look, we got to go onto the green because we're winning. Sorry, Sam Matterface, we got we needed Lineker and we got Waddle. Hey, uh, you, I, I, is that that bad? He's right. It was a bit harsh. Was it though? Let's go. Let's, you were laughing. Let's go. Let's go. Right, let's go. We got to go to the green. Pub and Harlow was like, yeah, it's Claire Waddle. We got to go to the green. We got to go. Please, Chris, we're way behind. Yeah, we'll move on. Green, Croatia, and Morocco. Uh, will this be the final? Probably not. Could it be the final? Who knows? Because they both played really well. Uh, Modric running the show for Croatia again. Yeah. Population of 4 million. We keep banging on about that. But um, it needs to be mentioned because they are constantly, constantly there thereabouts in these major tournaments. Um, and it's, it's perhaps the best thing we can say about Croatia is that we're not surprised that they're in a quarter final, that they're in a semi-final now. Uh, we wouldn't be surprised if they got to a final because they were there in 2018, of course. Um, uh, look, we've, we've already t- touched on Croatia enough. But Morocco, that's why we need to talk about because what they're doing, first African nation to ever reach the World Cup semi-finals. Could they be the first African nation to beat the, make the World Cup final? Quite possibly. Um, France certainly won't, won't have it easy in that semi-final this week. Uh, but Portugal starting brightly, you're getting chances, you're thinking, OK, this, this Portuguese team are going to win this match. But uh, Sofyan Amrabat, the man of the match for Morocco, I just want to give him a special mention because... Uh, he only touched the ball 32 times apparently in the 90 minutes but every time he touched the ball you could see Ali McCoist getting remarkably excited in, um, in stoppage time when he wins the ball and runs forward with it and leads from the front again uh, so, p- so people like Amrabat just sum up what this Moroccan team is all about they just don't concede that many chances now, Portugal had the odd chance Gonzalo Ramos had the header that he should have done better with Ronaldo had a half chance that Bono saved Pepe uh, Pepe's header well. yeah, yeah of course so there was moments where you think Portugal could have scored there but uh, on the regular guy, they just don't concede goals. Yeah. They only conceded once, isn't it? And that was their own goal. It was goal the only goal tournament, yeah. So uh, since he took over. Well, Gavin Comiskey was at the game, so we'll definitely talk to Gavin about it. Quick word on uh, Glenn. 
Yeah, Probably Glenn, good. also in the green, and uh, deservedly so. Maliki O'Rourke is a footballing guru, lads. Um, architect of success, it just follows him around everywhere he goes, the loop. Hard to believe, 2003 Ulster Club champion, so it's it's not his first time doing it. But every team he takes over, even T. Holland was his first management job in Monaghan in 2001, takes him to senior for the first ever time. Uh, so he's unbelievable. Uh, they only led for three and a half minutes of the semi-final last year, as Carol O'Kane pointed out on Twitter. They were ahead for 63 minutes of the 60 they played yesterday. Uh, the 112 to 16 win against Kilku. Uh, they were brilliant. Conleth McGuckian, man of the match, played remarkably well. Connor Glass in that midfield, alongside Emmett Bradley. That's an inter-county uh, midfield, never mind anything else. And then there's the sledging. We heard about Conor Glass afterwards. Will we have the clip? Conor Glass speaking to Washington O'Reilly after the game. Here's what he had to say. Talk to me about the intensity out there. I've covered a lot of games. This is probably one of the most intense games that I've covered from on the pitch to up on the stands to on the sidelines. Yeah, um, that, that's Kulku sort of. That's the, that's the way they play. And we had a match. We had a match their intensity. Um, they. They've been to three Ulster finals, they're all in champions last year, so it's that's a testament to those boys to go back year on year and stick at it. All those articles this week about the Brannigans talking about like this is what they do and this is their sole focus and you can see why why they've reached this pinnacle. Um but I guess we had that age, we had that heartbreak from last year, um and that's what got us over the line today. Yeah, very intense game, but a lot of respect out there because you do respect what Kulku have done for the game and for Ulster football. Uh, there was a lot of respect, but there's some respect that I don't have for some of the players. Like, um, but that's just that's just the way football is. Um, like, I'm not going to say like what stays in the pitch, like stays in the pitch, like, but it's it is what it is. What are you talking about? Maybe the midfield battle. That was one battle in particular that was a very tough one. Uh, I'll say nothing about it. All right, it's like there's some sportsmanship you like, like you can get on with, but then there's some, I guess, stuff you can't just forget. Like, so it is what it is. Yeah, uh, that was that was very interesting. Because you, you don't, he was, he was clearly... Fuming. He was clearly livid, yeah. I mean, he's holding <laughs> he back there, obviously, there. needless to say. Uh, but only, only just. Like, he's, there's something inside him that is like, something really bad was said. Something bad happened there. And he is very, very annoyed about it. Because at the end of the game, when it went full time, him and a couple of others were still involved in something. Yeah. You know, normally once the, once the final whistle goes, there's an immediate... Okay, grand or whatever, whatever's happened, has happened. But there wasn't that stage. I did feel like when the pitch invasion happened, this could get a little bit tasty. Mm. And then the flares were like, are the flares masking anything? Show us a bit more of those scenes. And then they're celebrating on the sideline. It's like, fair play to Malachi, it's amazing. Like incredible. What yeah. an incredible career he's putting together. But Connor Glass, he's a tough man. And something had pissed him off to the point where Ashing's like, you know, it's a nice, it's a nice like, oh yeah, of course we respect him. No, no. No, no, I'm, I'm not giving you my respect after that. I don't respect that. I mean, next year it's Sorry, tasty. Sorry, 100%. It's created a rivalry that we've, we've been looking for, probably in Ulster Club football again, since the cross days. But the, the speech from the captain, Conor Carville, as well, Jar afterwards, like you referenced people saying they were mentally weak, they lacked leaders, they had no characters. These Len lads had a be in their bonnet. And they've read everything. 100%. And well, the Brannigans during the week doing all their interviews, he was like, oh yeah, I mean, obviously it showed us what it means to them, but there was a, there was a sense of like, none of our boys are going to be doing those AIB gigs. Yeah, yeah. Let's just wait and see now, if any of them. And look, I was, I was, um, I was on to Conor Glass last week, and I'm sure you won't mind me saying, he was keeping the head down. He very much wasn't going to talk last week. Malachi O'Rourke was talking to him last week. He was very much keeping the head down. They were like, we'll talk to you after. Somebody else if can we do win. that. Exactly. So uh, he left it to them. Uh, they were brilliant. And, and like, <laughs> I don't know, Ender Gormley has to get a mention here for all the work he's done with this team. Like, this Glen team with, with the best minor team in Ulster, the best 21s team as well. And they finally kind of, like, look, they love their football up in Maharam. Myself and Joe were at a roadshow up there during the year when Derry were on their uh, run towards the All-Ireland All semi-final. They were class. And uh, they deserved it yesterday. The, the standard as well of club football with the split season is only going to get better and yesterday showed it. Um, I just, look, I, I said it a couple of weeks ago on the show and I'm not saying I told you so, but I did say Glenn would, would probably beat Kilku in the Ulster Club final. I you, do. Are, you are saying I told you so and you did also for, for you know, this, this clip won't do 100,000 views, but yeah. go on. I did say and, and stand by it that Glenn will go on and win, win the All-Ireland this year. Um, and I said that two weeks ago, mind you, before this game happened. Uh, I think I think Glenn will have too much for Mike Cullen. It's a it's a repeat, by the way, of two thousand and four when uh, Malachy took the loop from Derry against the Galway and Connacht champions Caltra, both the uh, first time provincial uh, semi finalists at that point. So uh, go on to play Mike Cullen. I think they'll have too much for Mike Cullen. And then in the final, I mean, it's going to be Kevin McCudd. Let's be honest. With all respect to Karen Zarahalis 
and stick that on your dressing room wall if you want. But I think the Kilmacud Glen final could be an all-time classic. Uh, I just fancy Lenny get over the line. All right, 15 minutes past eight this morning. Big call from our Ulster football correspondent in the Gillette Labs performance rankings. That was your Gillette Labs performance rankings. After the break, Daniel Harris is going to join us to reflect on England's dramatic World Cup exits. And uh, here's some Malachi O'Rourke talking after that game with Ashley. Malik O'Rourke, sum it up, Ulster champions, how does it feel? Yeah, it's a brilliant feeling, you know, we, we knew coming here today that we were going to have to put in a massive performance to, to take the crown of, of the Reign and All-Ireland champions and Ulster champions, obviously. Hey, and I suppose we got that, uh, you know, we started off the game really well and, and, and uh, had Kilku in a bit of bar, uh, you know, when we were able to get five points up, obviously the, the goal they got back and, uh, you know, put them right back in the game and then the penalty miss was, was a big one as well. Mm. But it still felt at half time the boys, you know, were, were were in good shape. You know, you know, the, the they were, you know, I suppose ready for for uh, any setback and, and just keen to push on the second half. And it took us a while, but we got there in the end. And coming into this game, did you hammer home to them how important to get a good start would be? Yeah, I suppose every team looks to get a, a good start, you know. But but we just felt that last year we were a wee bit passive against Kilku and and uh, we didn't ask enough questions of their defence. So we wanted to do that right from the off. Yeah, today we want to really ask questions of them and, and try to you know create a wee bit more space in there and, and, and then for our, our runners and, and to attack them spaces and, and get the scores and uh, lucky enough that, that worked out well especially early on and then the second half it, it was you know back to the wall a wee but they, they pushed up man to man but eventually we did get a few wee incisions and, and got a couple of scores that gave us that bit of breathing space and, and obviously then the goal at the end but the the, the cap on it yeah absolutely and pushing up on their kick out forcing them to go long that was probably a, a key thing in, within the game especially in that first half yeah it, it was you know we did it Kiku were very good on the ball and, and we wanted to make sure that, that, that they had the fight to get it and, and then put a bit of pressure on them as well and and then try to, to, to be solid defensively. You know, if you, if you didn't get the ball up there, try to be solid defensively. I thought, you know, the cause a couple of times, you know, they're, they're, very, they're very pacey and there's good movement up there. And the cause is obviously for the goal and, and, and even the, the penalty as well. But, but overall, you know, our defence was good. You know, the, the boys showed tremendous hunger right from the start, all around the field and got a couple of great blocks there towards the end of the game, you know, and it, it was lucky enough enough to see us through. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. OTB Sports Rugby. Do I think England are going to win the World Cup? They can, because they're still England. They can get it together. They've got a lot of players to pick from. But I think it, it was unlikely with Eddie, and it's probably still unlikely with Steve Warthwick or anyone else. Subscribe to the rugby stream on the OTB Sports app now. Are you a sports fanatic who loves to travel? Then sportspass.ie is for you. Log on for the chance to win the trip of a lifetime in 2023 to a top global sporting event. Eight winners get to choose from 12 incredible prizes, including trips to the Women's World Cup in Australia, the Super Bowl, the Masters and WrestleMania. All prizes include return flights, accommodation and tickets for two people from anywhere in the world. That's sportspass.ie. You win, you choose. OTB AM With Gillette Get into your flow With the new Gillette Labs Razor With exfoliating bar Right, 18 minutes past 8 Daniel Harris joins us to uh, parse over What happened with England in the World Cup Daniel, a nice easy question to start with What did happen? (laughs) Well, I think ultimately They played a good team And they didn't take advantage of their moments So um, you could I mean, Harry Kane called it small details But if we're being honest, a small detail is not lumping a penalty over the bar with five minutes to go or whatever it was. That is a fairly significant detail. And similarly, Harry Maguire complained about the referee, but it was not the referee who lost Olivier Giroud at the near post before the winning goal was scored. And it felt like this tournament was a big step forward for England. I definitely thought that. But when it came to it, if you look at the period of the game that they dominated, they didn't really create very much. And actually, the biggest chance in that period was the one that Olivier Giroud missed, the kind of sliding body that Pickford saved that he really should have scored. So I think there were improvements this time round, but again, they weren't quite good enough. Uh, what I don't really know is what is the f- uh, what 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 underpins the creation of chances. How are you going to win the game? Like, what is it that you do again and again and again? What are the good habits that you have in a match that creates chances? I don't see that from this England team? 
Well, I think that, I mean, France didn't really create too many chances either. If you, like, France had got Raphael Varane and Dale Pomecano playing at the back, they're good players. And then in front of that, they've got Rabiot, um, who's also a player in really good form. So you shouldn't necessarily expect to be tearing them apart and pummeling their goal because that's not something that France can allow you to do. Um, I think what England did this time around was um, they replaced Mason Mount, who was who was kind of, in theory, the number 10, who's meant to do lots of the prompting around the box with a different kind of player, with uh, G. Bellingham. So, the, and, J- and Jordan Henderson played in midfield. So physically, I think England were a stiffer proposition in midfield, but it meant that they were relying on the wide players to, to create opportunities rather than that man that was Mason Mount. And there is probably a different balance that they could find if they could find that player. Um, I think that they probably, once they've settled into that formation, will also find different ways of doing it because obviously they can create loads of chances against Senegal. They've created loads of chances against Iran as well. But doing that against France in the quarterfinal of a World Cup is different. And, and I don't think anyone's going to be creating chance after chance against that France team. And sometimes you also have to accept the fact that the opposition are good too. Sure, but how are they trying to create chances? Even if they're not doing it, what are they actually trying to do to to give Harry Kane an opportunity to score from open play? What, what are they trying to achieve? Uh, I think they're trying to... Well, the, the way that they're structured is that they've got one inverted winger and one winger keeping the width. So the idea, I think, is for Foden to try and get around the sides and to try and stay near the touchline and have Luke Shaw underlapping with him and overlapping with him. And then Saka, um, who's playing as an inverted winger, the plan is for him to wander in field and start trying to look to beat men in that area. And that was that looked England's likely a source of a goal in the, in the second half. Um, I think the plan is also that you want Jude Bellingham driving forward, making third man runs into the box to help Harry Kane. And that, I think, was one of the problems that I felt was the case while watching the second half, was that they weren't getting enough men into the box when the ball was out wide and when the opportunity, when it looked like there was an opportunity for the ball to be put into the box in a decent area, it often came in and it was only really Harry Kane surrounded by three or four defenders felt like Bellingham probably could have done more to get into the box. Jordan Henderson probably could have done more to get into the box. And once you've got a presence there, you're in a much better position to win second balls, which they weren't before. So perhaps a little a little bit more abandoned in that aspect. You can touch on any number of decisions from Gad Southgate, I guess, Daniel, as to, as to why this result didn't go England's way. Um, Marcus Rashford was England's top scorer in the tournament and he played four minutes off the bench. Like, Can you rationalise that? Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, I thought that Rashford did do enough in theory to get himself into the team. But my my guess is that the first thing is that Southgate Southgate likes Saka and he's all to players that he likes. And I think he also quite likes the fact that Saka can play fullback as well, which means, gives, means he'll be able to cover the flank in a slightly different way. And I think that he likes Foden because Foden's also a significant goal threat and he gives the team a balance with the left footer playing on the left. The other thing about it is that Rashford is a brilliant substitute. Uh, I can't remember the numbers, but his record as a sub for Man United is something like 12, 12 goals as a sub, two yeah, assists. Not if he has four minutes. 20... Pardon me? Not if, he's, not if he only gets four minutes. No, no, I, I felt like he, I felt like South Southgate didn't use the subs as well as he could this time round. It felt like when England were on top, he could have, he could have, exp- he could have gone with Mount earlier than he did and tried to, tried to go and win the game. Thought he went with Mount too late. Had no idea why he took off Saka and brought on Sterling because Saka was playing really well. And also Sterling is the kind of player, he might get you a goal, but he's unlikely, he's not someone I think was likely to create you very much. And by the time he went for Rashford, it was too late. But I understand why Rashford is on the bench to begin with, because throwing someone like Marcus Rashford on against a defender who's already been chasing around for 70 minutes is quite a proposition. But as you say, he, he did leave Rashford off too late. Did Harry Kane bottle it? Uh, yes. I don't like to say it because and I, when I say that Harry Kane bowled it, I feel like I'm suggesting that that's something that I wouldn't done, wouldn't have done, that I wouldn't expect <laughs> other people to do. Uh, but yeah, it felt to me like, I felt like he bottled one in the Euros against Denmark, uh, where in the semi-finals of the Euros, he's got a penalty and he took a really safe kind of low side foot penalty and he got lucky that Kasper Schmeichel uh, Cash with Michael shoved it out to him and he was able to score from the rebounds. Um, I thought this one, his body position wasn't quite right as he came in to take it. He was kind of crouching and then his head goes back and the ball goes over the bar. But when I say it, I think I think he bottled it. I mean, of course he of course he was nervous. It was a penalty with five minutes to go. And it, in a, 
in a, a World Cup quarter final against France, and his team were behind. So, yes, I do think he bottled it, but I don't say that particularly as criticism, although it is also his job not to bottle it. It is understandable why he felt in that situation. And I guess you don't have the safety in numbers that you do with a penalty shootout where the goalkeeper might save you, one of your mates might save you. You either do it or you don't. And that is very difficult to handle, I'm sure. Uh, it's interesting watching the various commentators talk in the aftermath of the game about what this defeat means. And I understand there's a process that you have to work through the various stages. Uh, I do feel, though, that like this is going to end up being one of those great opportunities missed because, just bear with me on this, France are a very good team, 100%. And uh, Mbappe had some influence on the game, not a massive one, but uh, France are missing a massive amount of world-class players, top-quality players, essentially their first choice centre midfield, and whether or not uh, you think Benzema improves the team, he is the Ballon d'Or, current Ballon d'Or holder. And not many teams manage to go back-to-back -back at World Cups. So it's right there for this England team, as opposed to the whole... I've seen, I've seen the tweet go viral about the age profile of the team. The age profile doesn't matter, because you don't know what form they're going to be in in four years' time, or what the injury profile is going to be. The World Cup happens now, and this was the chance for this team... I don't know who the next manager is going to be. I don't know if, if Southgate's going to be there in four years. I do feel like this is a big, big, big opportunity miss for England. A hundred percent, massive opportunity miss, and they know it. That's why you saw the desolation at the end because they know this was a chance. And I don't think the France injured players make so much difference. I mean, Angelo Kante was injured, but Angelo Kante is almost always injured now, and he's not the player that he was two years ago because he's almost never there. So I don't think it's that so much. And as you say, like we've seen Benzema's a brilliant player, but maybe Giroud makes the team better. Who knows? Because, I mean, he's, he's scored and Mbappe's doing well. So that seems like a reasonable thing to, to posit. But you're right to say that England had players in form, were playing well. But when you play France, who are the defending champions, going for another World Cup in a World Cup quarterfinal, that is a 50-50 game. And I mean, Southgate said it before the game, really. He said that, they knew until that point that if they played well, they'd win. And they also knew that they could play well in this game and not win. And that was pretty much what happened. Um, so you're right to say that you don't know who's going to be in form. You don't know who's going to be fit for the Euros in two years' time. But it does feel that these players being fit and in form is more likely than these players being fit and out of form because they're young. So they're likely to be fit. And generally, players are fit, not injured. And they're likely to be informed because these are high-level players who will spend most of their career in pretty decent nick. So although, as you say, this was a massive missed opportunity, I wouldn't say that it's an opportunity that's unlikely to come back again. Saw a video this morning, Daniel, of um, uh, Mbappe trying to shake Jordan Henderson's hand before the match in the tunnel and Henderson uh, very much point blank ignoring him. Um, like, is an argument, and then like France start the brighter of the two teams, like, is there an argument that England might have been almost too hyped up for the game, given that this is England, this is a World Cup quarter final, putting a lot of pressure on themselves, maybe. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't read too much into into that handshake, particularly that different players like to approach games in different ways. Mm. Some players like to be dead focused, and I guess Jordan Henderson's one of them. And some are happy to be kiss, kissing and cuddling in the tunnel with the players that they're mates with. And uh, no, I, I mean, I'm sure the England players were nervous, but I didn't watch it and think. This, the game's got big on these particularly. It's just France started well because France are, France are a good side. One And there's no reason to... If you haven't have seen Jordan Henderson not shaking Mbappe's hand and France have started the better, you wouldn't necessarily have said, well, England are too focused mm. or England taking it too seriously. You just would have expected that was one of the possibilities that could be the case. So, no, I, I, I don't think England played like a team on whom the game got big. Uh, who do you think should slash would replace Southgate if he does end up leaving? Like, who are the <clears throat> the runners and riders in your view? Uh, I mean, I had a look at the list just before and there was a lot of names on it. Maurizio Pochettino, Thomas Tuchel, Wayne Rooney, Frank Lampard, Graham Potter. Um, I, I, I feel like I'm of the opinion that the England manager should be English. And that's not because I support England, I don't. It's not because I'm a little Englander, I'm not. It just feels a bit like that should those should be the rules of international football. I would agree. But yeah, like I mean, if I saw somebody saying the England manager needs to be concerned with uh, the quality of coaching around the country, and actually, I, I, it's weird, right? Because they shouldn't really, but I do see that they're a figurehead at the top of an organization 
that basically invent football. And so, you know, has has it's not, it's not it's a very unusual job in world football. And maybe maybe that's the whole problem here is that there's a massive overreaction and correction from Capello who didn't care. Eventually we get to where we are now and we've got, you know, uh, the circuitous route to get here. And maybe it's wrong. Maybe Tuchel comes in and cares about nothing except winning and falls out with all the players and doesn't. And the players are all are all kind of, I don't know, slightly despised by the, the the fans. But then they win and everybody's like, oh, that, that's how you do that. I don't know. I don't know. It's so weird. Yeah, it just feels like that you're trying to test which country is the best at this. And we're agreed that manager is a significant role then why would you not have the manager being from the same country? Why would that not be the rules? And I guess the, the only reason I think not is that you want the game to develop in countries that are less traditional football powers and perhaps they need some outside knowledge. I don't, but that's really the only reason I can think of for that to be the case because otherwise it seems contrary to what international football is about, <laughs> that the manager shouldn't be from the country. So I would... I mean, I think that, I, I I mean, as I said, I'm not an England fan, but if I was, I would probably want Southgate to stay because I think that they took big step forwards during this tournament. I thought in the last World Cup, they got pretty lucky with the draw, but they they just weren't, they weren't as good a team, but they got to the semi-finals because the draw worked well for them. Then in the Euros, I felt like they were unduly conservative in almost all the big games where they made hard work of beating Germany, who they should have beaten more comfortably than that. They made really hard work of beating Denmark. And then they went ahead against Italy and they sat back. This time around, it felt like there was they, they, were more, they were much closer to settling a way of playing that was working and that was sustainable. They had options on the bench. They had attackers in form. And it felt like until, until those subs that we talked about, it felt like South, Southgate was doing a pretty good job of husbanding his resources. And it felt like they were a much better team now than they were two years ago. And when you're thinking about whether a manager should be replaced, that's what personally I'm always looking for is, is progress and hope. Do I think that that team is progressing? And do I think that the people that follow that team can ha- will, will be hoping, will have, have hope that is not yet extinguished that this manager is the guy that's going to make it better? And I do think that Southgate is in the process of making it better. So I, I, would, I would say that he should stay because I think also that international football is a very different job from club football managing in those things where you've got much less time to do tactical work in international football. It's much more about picking the right team and getting them picking in the right, getting them playing in the right formation. Southgate knows these players really well. I think he's quite close to having that. So I think that him staying would probably be the right thing to do. Yeah. If he goes... I haven't got a clue who would come in and do this job better than he would. It's Not because I don't think there are better managers around than him. Maybe Maurizio Pochettino would come in and do the job better. But I've explained why I don't think it should be him or Tuchel. And yeah. then you're looking at someone like Graham Potter or Ray Rooney or Frank Lampard. And I'm not sure we know anything about them, really. Like Frank Lampard is... I mean, he failed at Derby. He failed at Chelsea. And he's not doing particularly well at Everton either. Then you've got... Wayne Rooney would be a punt, would be great for him to come in and do well, but a total punt. Speaks about the game well. The players would be motivated to play for him because he's Wayne Rooney, but be box you office. need more than that. That would be box office. Uh, one, one counterpoint to all this, um, obviously the FA have success of a non-English manager fresh in their minds from Serena Wiegmann with the women's team, and maybe that's something that they're like, okay, we understand how this can work, and it, it doesn't somehow betray what is supposed to be good about the football project at sorry but the Republic of Ireland's greatest ever manager was English I don't think nationality comes into it well I think if you're England things are slightly different well, though maybe maybe you know but I mean I just, think it comes into the, I just think it comes into the rules I mean I, I'd love for them to go and get Emma Hayes from Chelsea I think she'd be good with these players I think she'd do a brilliant job I mean it would never happen but um, and I'm not saying that the England men's team should just be able to go and pluck the manager out of the, out of the best team in the England, England, England women in the uh, WSL but I think Emma Hayes would be someone that I would love to see have a go at doing this job. I know you have to go, right? But the one thing I would say about the point you're making earlier on about how this opportunity will come along for them again, like the last time that Brazil won the World Cup was 2002 and we assume that these chances will keep coming for teams because of age profile or talent funnel or whatever, but like it doesn't. They just football teaches you that you get an opportunity at bat, you get a 15 minute period in the game, you have to crush the opposition in that 15 minute and they couldn't do it. 
I, I agree with all of that, but I wouldn't say that Brazil didn't have it hasn't the opportunity hasn't come around for them again. The opportunity came around for them this time, and and they botched it. The opportunity came around for them last time, and they happened to get hit by that Belgian team's sole good performance in knockout football, more or less. They had the opportunity, but it is in a in a in a, in a tournament. It is it's it's a very small window of opportunity because some because things can happen, and you don't have the opportunity to redeem it. It's not even like the Champions League where you get another leg. So they did have the opportunity, but bringing it home is difficult, which is why the last time the World Cup was retained was Brazil in 58 and 62. That is very hard to do. So I, I think, I'm not saying that England will, have, will win the next Euros, but England will be in with a serious chance of winning the next Euros and the World Cup after that, and probably the Euros after that as well, because the conveyor belt of players that they have coming through now is extremely significant and extremely serious. But taking that final step, requires lots of things to fall into place and that may not happen. Daniel, good stuff as ever. Thanks a million. See you later, bye. That's uh, Daniel Harris giving us some thoughts there. Uh, if you've got views, and I know you do, 0879-180-180 is the WhatsApp number or you can leave a comment on the YouTube stream. And a reminder, OTBAM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. There's a positive from England. There was a moment, I don't know if people saw the clip of the Kane miss penalty. Straight away, uh, Kane's head is in his hands he's in despair and who runs over to him but the 19 year old Jude Bellingham to console him and say let's go we still have time here to get a goal Yeah, and like that was impressive and even at the end the cameras are trying to get to Kane of course they are and you have Pickford and Trippier pushing the cameras away and saying have a bit of respect yeah stop stop I mean stop lads yeah obviously the cameras want to get Pickford to Harry Kane Pickford being big lad come on yeah, oh, giving, Jordan. It, giving it loads. I can see how you, you uh, want to look after your teammate in that moment. Yeah, but look, look, you know, I just, uh, I'm just not sure. I just don't think that you can go. Oh, we made progress. Everything's getting better. We're getting better. We're go- it's going to happen. It, uh, that's not how it works. It doesn't. No. It doesn't happen. This, this could be Mayo. This yeah. is Mayo. They've just scored the two own goals in the All Ireland final. We're definitely going to get there. We have to look how close we were. The greatest team of all time couldn't even beat us without oh scoring two own goals. We're definitely going to win at some point. That doesn't happen. It, it reminds me of, uh, and I bring everything back to snooker, of course, but I was tra- remember chatting to Ronnie O'Sullivan off air uh, a few years ago with the Crucible about Kyron Wilson, who was reasonably young at the time, and he was like, I was like, surely Kyron has the talent to go on, and, like he has the right to go on and win a, uh, a world title at some point. He said, no one has a right to go and win a world title. Same with England. They, on paper, yes, they should win a major tournament trophy, but nobody has a right to. Brazil don't have a right to. It's whoever shows up on the, on the given year, and it takes four years to come around. So, Is there anybody important missing from England? In terms of injury in in this World Cup, like Ben White apparently had a fight. They they said they played down reports that he had a yeah. fight with a member of the backroom team. Uh, Madison obviously got injured in the last game and, and was obviously completely pointless. Then bringing him after all the hoo-ha would might might have been interesting to see if he'd been fit, if he could have done anything. But like that nah, was their full squad. It it was like that's their full right? squad. Right, and and this is a World Cup where everybody is losing players who are key players who are going to be important for us. I, I do think any criticism of Gareth Southgate though is unfair. Like he's been there six years, he's done brilliant things with Gareth this team. Gareth Southgate's a, a good manager, not a great manager, and I just think that like, is he not a great international manager? Well, I mean, World Cup semi final, World Cup quarter final, Euros final, kick of a ball from winning the Euros against Italy two years ago. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. not bad. England hadn't been in a major final in so so You're long. You're saying great. Like great, like you know, well, all time great. After Alf Ramsey, he's the best England manager there's be, ever been. Yeah, okay. But did he... Does that not make him great? I don't think so. I think that you've got like a, a big, broad definition of great, if that's... Well, the standards are high. Of course, winning a major tournament is, is the bar that England have set because of... Didier Deschamps, great international manager. You know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But like, does, South, does Southgate not come under the level of great, given how many so-called great managers came before him? Capello, Sven, like, Venables, all Sven, these guys. Sven, I don't think anybody thought Sven was great. No, no, but I don't think I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe Sven is a bad example. But I mean, Bobby Robson didn't get to a, a World Cup final again. Bobby Robson, you know, not a great, not one of the greats of the game. Like a great character and lovely fella. Yeah, but like, uh, you know, know, we're it, talking. Great means Cruyff. He's one of the great England managers. Zidane. Ah, well, well, now you've changed it. Well, he's, he's one of the great Gareths. He's a great international Even manager. Even in the office. I think he'd struggle to have uh, a club a club job after this. I think oh. he's he's suited to the international role. The Americans, the Americans are already talking about him as a potential. So, uh, right, it is eight thirty nine. Tune into the lunchtime wrap today, bringing you all the latest sports news. That's with thanks to Deliveroo. Check out the app for some great match day meal deals across the World Cup. Deliveroo food, we get it. Right, Carl is here. Carl, how are you? How are you, lads? How's it going? 
We talked about Glenn's win in the performance rankings. What did you make of it? Highly impressive. Mm. Highly impressive. I think Shane, you called this last week that they were going to be. Thanks. Thanks You're very nice. Of, there, nice of you to bring that up. He wasn't going to. Oh wait, he already <laughs> did. Yeah. Um, but I keep saying it. Yeah, yeah. Some game, wasn't it? It was uh, really high standard. Um, yeah, I mean, Glenn have, have been a remarkable story. Really, that they struggled to win in Derry for so long, and then they've come along and dominated now. And Kilku had their stint as All-Ireland champions but it's gone now and you can't really argue with it yesterday I thought Glenn fully deserving of the win they got the lake gold to put the, the icing on the cake um, but it's going to be fascinating to see how they progress now into the All-Ireland stages and we have to say I mean Maliki O'Rourke and you know all about Maliki O'Rourke I, I, I think Maliki O'Rourke is one of the top managers one of the great, greatest GA managers of all time and sorry let me just let me just point this out. Hang on, uh, sorry. Are you still are you still in your Garth Hackett? Yeah, what do you I was mean this? Say. No, I genuinely I think he's in the top <clears throat> the top five GA managers there's ever, there's ever been. Really? Ever? Like York. Yeah, ever. Right. I'm telling you. So okay. I, see, I, I, like, let me explain. You, you, okay, well, I will. Right. But you you do lose credibility when you say Garth Southgate is great and you come along. So just so for context here, Garth Southgate no longer great. You've changed your mind. But in in this instance, go on. Oh, right. Malachy Rourke, his first job in management, T Holland Monaghan Club, uh, very small parish. Two thousand and one, he takes them over, brings them to senior senior grade for the first ever time right he moves on then uh, he, he's busy he's, of course he's, every team's after him then at that point the loop he gets the loop job up in Derry the 68 years they never won a Derry senior championship he wins it goes on wins Ulster um, Eric Kieran job wins a senior championship with Tyrone that was the next job Kevin Gales in 2007 he's only in charge for a short time because his home county for Manicum calling first ever Ulster final in 26 years replay against Armagh Fermanagh have never won to this day an Ulster Senior Football Championship title and he came closest as Fermanagh manager. Um, Monaghan job 2013, his first year in charge, wins Division 3, wins Ulster for the first time in 25 years. His second year in charge, wins Division 2, gets to an Ulster final. His third year in charge, stays in Division 1, wins Ulster and for the remainder of his tenure, keeps Monaghan in Division 1. Like, he's, a, he's an... He's an Absolute guru in in, in Monaghan. And, and, sorry, Glenn had never won a Derry Senior Championship. Takes them over, wins it. Wins it again this year. Wins Ulster for the first time. And I think they're going to go on and win an All-Ireland Club title. I've said it already. I think they beat Moy Cullen in the semi. And I think that final against Kilmacud, if it is Kilmacud, uh, is going to be an absolute classic. Malachy O'Rourke is without a question. Just look at his record. Look at his CV. Everywhere he goes, he touches gold. He just turns teams into, into winners. He's a serial winner. What's he going to be doing during the summer? Well, the rumour was that Donegal and Meath were after him in the, uh, during the summer and he didn't want a if you're, any job. If you're, I mean, okay, so you've convinced me here, right? But if you're one of the other uh, managers who are trying to knock Kerry and Dublin off their perch, you're mm. like, look, no commitment. Just just come to a few training sessions. It, yeah. you, know, you don't you don't have to marry us. <laughs> just have just, a look. Exactly. Just come down. See if you like the vibe. Yeah, yeah. Maybe he goes out in high if he wins the All Ireland with, with Glenn this year, then it's right. But, but I'm not talking about like full time, you know, like completely pressure free. You come and. Backroom job. Exactly, yeah. Like, and then obviously take your time and do whatever it is you want. Because uh, maybe he sticks around with Glenn for next year to see. Possibly. And I don't know. Like he's, he's got the, sorry, the strength and conditioning as well of, of Glenn. You could see they weren't going to run out of steam. Mm. Ryan Porter deserves a lot of credit. He follows Maliki around every job he gets. He was with Monaghan for that entire time as well. He's the SNC guy, is he? He's, the, he's unbelievable. He coaches the team. Like he's just incredible. Um, and that, that should, shouldn't go unnoticed. But what he's done to that Glenn team. Like they were powerful at the weekend. Like mm. Glass and Brady in the middle are just unstoppable. Like the yeah. sledging was an interesting one. Yeah, there's a very inter- I'm sure you've spoken about Ashling's interview with Conor Glass mm. after that's. Uh, on social media at the minute, but there was obviously a lot of tension between the two teams. Glass had not calmed down when he was talking to her. He yeah. was, he was like, they just won. There's an outpouring of emotion, but he was still angry about something. He was. So it must have been relatively serious. Yeah, um, very interesting interview. Uh, and before he spoke to Ashley, and I know there was loads of people coming up to him just for autographs and little kids and stuff. And football and Derry seems to be on a real high mm-hmm. uh, right now. And it's definitely the intercounty stuff has transferred to the club scene. Um, and they certainly have a swagger about them now. Someone said five or six Derry clubs have won the, won the Ulster in the last 20 years or something, maybe. Yeah, they've a really good, they've really good uh, club championship. Yeah. Really good club championship. And um, if Rory Gallagher can keep that going now at uh, county level, you know, they, they could be back in the upper echelons for a long time Yeah. The, the one thing I'd say about watching the game at the weekend and look this is hardly new news there was a black card at one point for Kilku I think it was Paul Devlin sent off the black card uh, look we've spoken about this a number of times during that 10 minutes I think the ball was maybe in play for 3 Right. and like the Kilku boys kept going yeah, down yeah, yeah. there needs to be uh, whether it's for the entire game or for just during black cards but there needs to be a, the clock needs to be stopped 
during those 10 minutes for the black cards for, for every foul now maybe you do it for the entire game regardless you just have 20 minutes of injury time at that's the what end that's what I was going to say dude maybe. like the World Cup Although, no but then the, the black card is, yeah. you see but then, yeah that's true but the, the, every team during that, that time period every, every team has, has copped on it's, to trying to kill it's time it's terrible yeah. to watch because you know as soon as a black card happens you're like this next 10 minutes is going to be putrid because the, the team with black card are of course going to go down on their one knee so stop the clock either during that 10 minutes or for the entire game just stop the clock every time there's a break I mean, if the player goes down injured, whether he's injured or not, and I'd have my suspicions in that 10 minutes whether those cool, cool players were really injured, but you just something needs to happen in that aspect of the game. Look, it was still a great game regardless. Have Kilku gone from like being everybody's favourite team, great underdog story, to now the pariahs in the space That's what of like when you win. That's what happens when minutes. you win. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they've been brilliant though, haven't they? And the, the, the quality of the game yesterday was class. Like The start of it particularly was, was ferocious. Mm. Straight away, you're like, this is unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is going to be the game that everyone built it up to. So, be. just for a lot of people will just see the scoreline and go, it seems fairly one sided, but it wasn't at all. No, they got that late goal mm. from, in it at a time, uh, Glenn. So they were three points up. It was very close, um, very little between the teams all the way through. And eight wides to three. Kilku had eight wides. Glenn had three. Yeah. Probably the shooting accuracy helped as well. Like if Kilku had taken some of those chances, who missed the penalty? Who was it? Missed the penalty. Um, I can't remember who, who missed the penalty for Kilku. It was Kilku uh, missed the penalty. Yeah. But like I mean, there were chances there, do you know. Yeah. I, I mean, it was just disappointing for them. But Kilku, all of a sudden, as you say, they're a small parish, but they're probably the villains now. Like they go from being the team that were the underdogs to All Ireland champions last year. Um, I just Connor Glass is so angry afterwards. Fuming. Like, and he wasn't the only one, you know. So obviously something was going on. Yeah, but I wonder, yeah. They played each other last year as well, so obviously something maybe lingered on, did it? Yeah, I mean, I, like I'm sure the sledging in Ulster club football is is as bad as anywhere. It probably is. Like, what's your What's your experience of well, it? Well, there's stories of lads like, uh, sto- like saying horrific things to people, but also like you'd be getting girlfriends' mobile numbers of, of fellas who they know. Well, that's be the old one. That's the throne. Of course. Yeah. But like, I, I don't know what was said to Conor Glass. Clearly, something that stuck in his head. Um, <laughs> It, it, you could see, you almost read between the lines in what he was saying, but maybe that that's what it takes sometimes. And and as he said, sometimes you can't leave it all on the pitch. Um, he was quite at pains to say that. What uh, a great competition the Ulster Club is! Ah, it's brilliant. What a great competition! So what, good. What <laughs> else is going on? Uh, plenty going on. Uh, good weekend for Irish Athletics. Yesterday they won five medals at the European Cross Country Championships in Turin. In the men's under-20 race, Nick Griggs won silver, Dean Casey took bronze and in the team event at under-20 level, uh, Ireland took silver. The women's team then won bronze as well and the men's under-23 team also finished in third. Katie McCabe was on the score sheet for Arsenal in the women's Super League yesterday. They were 4-1 winners over Aston Villa to move up to second in the table. Chelsea lead the way following their win over Reading by three goals to two. Manchester City and Manchester United played out a one all draw and West Ham had a 2-0 win uh, over Tottenham in the Champions Cup as you'll be uh, chatting to Alan about the Munster head coach Graeme Rowntree believes his side had the chances to beat Toulouse yesterday they lost by 18 points to 13 at Thoman Park Ulster sh- suffered a 39-0 defeat to Sale and Dan McFarlane the Ulster coach uh, refusing to blame their travel difficulties uh, for that hefty loss uh, due to cancelled flights Ulster only arrived yesterday before that match on the morning of the game uh, in South uh, in hockey, the Irish women's team face a must-win match at the Nations Cup later this morning. They take on Italy from 9.45. They need to win to maintain their hopes of reaching the knockout stage after a 2-0 uh, first-round loss to Spain yesterday. And Ken Doherty, Jared Green and Mark Allen all in action at the English Open snooker today. Is the English Open important? Uh, it's, it's a ragged event, but it's not. It's not massive. Well, I'm, just think, I'm already thinking about the World Championships. But you've got the snooker starting this week. Uh, Jerry, which I know you're, you're, you're mad excited about. Thursday, I think, is the first day of the PDC World Championship, so Christmas will start in earnest Fantastic with the, with the darts. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Lorcan says, uh, many down clubs happy Kilku got beat, I'd say. I mean, look, you never want Shelbyville to do well when you're from Springfield. That's fair <laughs> enough. Like, you just don't. Yeah. So I, d- yeah, I don't, true. you know, that's... Uh, I, had uh, this, uh, I had this conversation with someone at the pub and they laughed me off. Would Kilku beat down? I mean, down are we going there again, Shane? Are we going there again? Down are fairly... Will they win the Talshan Cup? <laughs> I'll, I'll go there. But like if, if Kilku have all their Kilku players and down, don't, don't get the Kilku players, it'd be a good game. Yeah. Do, maybe down still win. It's, it's another county side. I, I'm not going to step in it again. I'm not going to go there. Yeah, if, if uh, Kilkeen the would win the Talshan, then what would Len do? <laughs> Somebody who's uh, signed in as Jerry Adams this morning says, uh, come on, the South Derry lads. 
Uh, Glass is spot on with the Kalku ones. Hateful what way they act on the pitch, says Patrick Campbell. And then somebody else says, Glass was a bit fragile. Hey, that's Miguel. It's like oh. a, that's the, you get it. You see what it's saying. And then Daddy Max says, small parish, big mouths. But then he's got a smiling face emoji, so he gets away with it, I think. We're yeah. not saying that. We're not saying that. That's uh, <laughs> Danny Mac. You want to see, you do want to see a bit of, um, a bit of niggle in games like that. Like, sledging, Sledging is grand once it reaches a certain level and then you can't just, you just can't overstep that mark. You know, I think everyone knows what the mark is. You just don't say, you don't get too personal with, with players. Mic everything up. Yeah, 100%. Mic everything up. Let's hear what they were saying. You can't mic the players really. Why not? Like, Why not? I mean, Why not? Well, you can leak what was said. We'll start with micing the refs. Yeah, and, and oh, look, we, we heard what the story was. So, I don't know. I think that like if you're willing to say something, you should be willing to say it. Mm. No? Uh, maybe not to your opposition number. Like you're just marking him, and you probably whisper something to him. And uh, I mean, if you're whispering something darkly, but if then if it comes out afterwards, what you were saying, what you were saying, you're gonna stand over it. Yeah, that's true. Probably. Yes, not. that is who I am. Yeah. Oh, that, I'm not that type of player. It turns out you are. Oh, but I, I think I'm a fairly um, laid back type of person. But if I'm if I'm in a football pitch or a soccer pitch, you know, sometimes you get carried away. You maybe don't say things that you wouldn't stand by, but uh, you probably are, you're you're a, you're a more aggressive version of yourself on a sporting pitch than you are in real life. And I think that's okay, as long as you don't overstep the mark. Sounds like the Kaku lads maybe overstepped a, a mark, potentially. Yeah, well, if they all come out and say, oh, I'm sorry, we shouldn't have done it. But, like, I don't think if... if um, not those specifically, but, like, do you think when people do overstep the mark, they're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that? Or they're like, yeah, I'll do it again in the morning. That's the win at all costs mentality, which has poisoned all of sport. Mm. Where you can say hateful, horrific things to people and go, I was in the name of victory. I was representing my parish, I had to do it. Yeah, it's what it takes to win. I mean, look, I was watching the All Ireland Ladies Club final before it in Kilcairn Clonburn. By the way, last year winning the All Ireland for the first time, winning it again, beating Dunamoyne at the weekend. But you're watching some of the, the aggressive matchups in that game as well. And you're thinking, well, things are being said in every game. Like and and maybe sometimes it, it it's okay, but yeah, Glenn clearly had the newspaper, the fancy dance up on the wall. I mean, because seeing the Kilku lads out talking during the week, I mean, they referenced it. It's uh, that was old school. Oh, and the speech as well. Um, now, uh, Kieran McFall's name was brought up as well, and uh, we know he was um, involved in an incident in Boston over the summer, and he wasn't playing for for uh, for Glenn yesterday. Um, so he's, big, been, he's been accused of assault yeah over in Boston where he was during the summer um, and there, he's standing trial for it standing uh, trial, hasn't been home it's been ankle tag uh, G, uh, GPS ankle tag the whole lot um, serious internal injuries for, for some incident an assault that happened in Boston um, played a game for Donegal Boston a few days after this incident was, was, was said to have occurred um so yeah, referenced by Malachy O'Rourke and by, by um, Conor Carville, the, the Glen captain, after the match as well. So that's uh, another thing to note. Uh, right, we're getting grief for not mentioning Michael Conlon, the big win at um, the SSC Arena, first round stoppage. His first first round stoppage, I think, as a professional at the weekend. Um, he's, he's really coming back from the defeat to Lee Wood earlier on in the year at the moment. And so I think it's a long way back at this stage, but he's going to make it. They're like Obviously, he's a big name, he's got name recognition. Um, I do think he probably needs to have a big win before he gets to fight again in America. So I don't know what do what do you want to say? Like we can we can talk about it, we can not talk about it. Whatever. Oh eight seven nine one eighty one eighty is the WhatsApp number. Or you can continue to abuse us in the WhatsApp comments this morning. <laughs> um, share your best edging. Don't do that. We'll have to delete the comments. <laughs> Usually that happens anyway in the YouTube. Yeah. We, we get sledged, so it's fine. Right, a reminder, the only place... Thanks, Million Call. Thanks, lads. Uh, a reminder, the only place to listen back to Monday Night Rugby, Wednesday Night Rugby and Brian O'Driscoll in full is on the OTB Rugby podcast feed. You can subscribe now on the OTB app. While we're on rugby, time to say good morning to Alan Quinlan. Alan, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, lads. Very good, thanks, Joe. Tommen, a bit cold and a bit, um, a bit miserable by the end last night. Yeah, it was. People couldn't uh, couldn't probably see the play um, in the second half with the fog and, and the icy conditions. So it was um, it was difficult at one stage. Anton Dupont, I think, on fifty three minutes asked the referee about uh, the danger of, of not being able to see the ball and see the players. Um, the referee said he was fine; he could still see the touch the touch flags, the f- four corner flags. But um, yeah, it was. Um, it was really, really cold and foggy, and it probably played a little bit of a part in it being a, a bit of a stop-start, uh, slow tempo to the game in the second half, in particular. 
we were talking about this earlier on about the context of the quality of the performance and the opposition and you have to take all that into account in the aftermath of the game the dust has settled what's your take on, on where Munster are at the moment? Um, it's, it's a strange one because it, it, it was flat and I think Toulouse managed to, to take the sting out of the crowd and particularly in that second half take you know the sting out of Munster I think they started really well the first 20 25 minutes were, were, were very good. They held on to the ball a lot. Um, they were trying to attack, vary their game. And that was certainly uh, very, very pleasing to see the way they, they came out and tried to play. Um, you, when you lose by a score, Jer, against uh, an incredibly powerful side, uh, it was 10 of these guys won a Grand Slam with France. So they have a lot of experience, a lot of quality, a lot of power. Um I think it's a bit frustrating for Munster because that second half, they probably just made some mistakes and errors. And a lot of it was, a fair bit of it was down to pressure from Toulouse and their physicality. But I think when they look back, they'll be a little bit disappointed with some parts and some mistakes they made. Um, but where Munster are at, I think it was it's you'd have to be upbeat because it's very hard to be critical of Munster given the depth and the quality of the opposition compared to themselves and say, well, that's not good enough and they should should have won that game and they did X, Y and Z wrong. So um, it's the start of, of of a lot of change and that's been spoken about a lot since the start of the season. And <clears throat> they put themselves in a position and were, were kind of going for it at the end, albeit you know they had to go a long way down the field to try and get the score to win the game. So... Um, I think where they're at at the moment is is for some players and and for monster fans and stuff. It's it's that's the level that's required. And you know, I don't think anyone going into the game would have thought monster, you know, even with Europe, um, can can potentially win Europe. That's that's not a reality at the moment. So um, they could have easily got got a win, but um, struggled against that power. And they've got to get more depth in the squad. And that's, that's so that's, a that's known fact. That's the that's the key bit here. Like, um, do you feel like the coaching ticket is uh, progressing and getting the best out of this group of players? And that the main issue is that they need more players, as opposed to in the past we would have been concerned about the coaching ticket not having the ambition to try and and create a game plan that ultimately will be successful. Yeah, for sure. I think even if you go back to the game in May under the old coaching tickets, the quarterfinal and the Aviva, I think Munster's attack was was uh, they were a lot more ambitious than than in, we normally would see. So, um, but but now in particular, I think it'd be very unfair to be critical yesterday as to the way Munster played, in a sense that you know they weren't trying to slow the game down. Toulouse actually kicked the ball. 36 times in the game and that tells you you know France do that similarly as well with Dupont and Intimac once we kick the ball 22 times that's a fairly low number so you know they tried to run back Mike Haley Calvin Nash and Daly a lot when the ball was kicked down to him traditionally we would have seen them just thumping the ball back up the field or kicking it up in the air now a couple of times they had to do that but I think there's a, there's a little bit more freedom in the way they're trying to play there was a lot of movement and little um, kind of evasion in 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 the, in the attack. A um, couple of times it hit up midfield. They try and come back down the blind side with set moves and strike plays and stuff like that. And sometimes it broke down because Toulouse actually really cut out Monster's time and space in the ball. Joey Carberry was was under immense pressure when he was getting the ball. Craig Casey when he was on the field. Paddy Patterson when he was on. So. Um, they were shrewd in what they were doing and they tried to nullify Munster. And obviously when you don't have an X factor player who's just going to run out over people or do something magical, um, their collective was very good, I thought, Munster and, and what they were trying to do and their shape. So that's encouraging. Um, you get more players in the mix and you you increase your depth. And, and, and look, one of the areas and the very obvious area is the power up front. You know, Emmanuel Ma- Miafu, the second row, he's 145 kilos. He's six foot nine. He broke up a lot of monstrous malls. Like in that start of that second half, they had a couple of opportunities and, you know, they're holding him up. Um, 
Uh, so there's, there's, there's incredible power there. Richie Arnold, he's 125 or 30 kilos as well, the second row. Once you were missing three second rows yesterday, you know, Finneen Witchley, Thomas Ahern, RG Snyman has been out for a long time. So when you play a t- side like Toulouse, who had six forwards on the bench um, and the impact they had, just look at their front row coming off the bench. They're, there's very few teams can do that across Europe. And the top five or six that you would pick before last week that potentially could win the tournament are, are, can do that. But there's a there's a backlog of, of teams behind it who just can't. So, um, you know, it's upbeat and it's pleasing that um, they tried to play. Um, a little bit frustrating that they weren't able to, able to win the match. Yeah, it does seem strange, Quinny, because like, a number of years ago, if Munster lost a home game like this, it, it'd be reading the riot act. But it wasn't so long ago on the show we were reading Munster's obituary because things did not look too good. But, you know, even if you look at the games before the, the game of the weekend, three wins, some decent performances, things are possibly looking up there's positive shoots to take yeah and I think that's the reason I think Shane um, reality is you know with the squad Munster have and um, you know we had this chat in the last couple of weeks uh, particularly around the Edinburgh fixture previously should should players be rested and you know held back for Toulouse the same team has probably played for three weeks on on the bounce now and uh, Europe in reality, is is the, the the league position is more of a priority now than Europe, and that was the case before yesterday's game. But Graham Rountree's selection was as strong as he possibly could yesterday. So you know, Munster would never disrespect the competition, pick a weakened team. I'm sure they. I'm, I'm nearly sure they wouldn't. Um, but um, the reason there's positives is because people can see that they're they're trying to play better. Um, you can't physically take on a team like Toulouse up front and and think you're going to overpower them. Traditionally, Munster had you know a lot of strength and depth right across the board. So um, there's there's younger players here, and there's a lot of change, and there's certain areas that their the depth chart is not good enough, and they've got to try and increase and improve that. And Graham Rountree has in the next couple of years. So that's why there's a bit of patience there. What what you know if Munster were humiliated yesterday. It'd be a big worry and a concern, but I actually thought, you know, their effort level, their commitments, they could have been a lot shrewder in, in certain things, and um, that they did for sure. And they came up with some mistakes in that second half, but <clears throat> overall, I don't think they're getting a free pass here to say, you know, I think they'll criticize. There'll be certain, as I said, certain things that that should have been a little bit better, and um, but overall, I think they. You know they they tried to attack, and I think that's why what people could see from yesterday. Um, someone who was humiliated were Ulster. Uh, I, I, like may, maybe the rugby world expected something similar in terms of the outcome for this, but it felt pretty shocking. It felt pretty shocking, particularly I, I even saw the last twenty minutes. So by that stage, the game was 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 done. But um, there was no cohesion in that final bit, even to like or no sense of the team coming together and saying, right, this is really bad, but we need to show something here so that. Later on in the season, we'll at least have these twenty minutes to go. It was up against. We were up against it, and we showed them. Instead, they just completely fell apart. So, um, it's it's kind of shocking. Um, that was probably the most surprising thing because even when they were twenty points down, you think they're going to react here, and and um, of course, Sale may go on and score again, but you know, you get some points on the board, and it just never happened. Leinster and Ulster had obviously travel travel problems at the weekend. Um, Ulster looked like a team that um, never got off the plane at all. Um, they were to take off on Saturday, um, get over to Manchester, have have a run out, have food, relax in the hotel, get all their business done, rest up, and obviously their plane was cancelled. And then they they end up travelling Sunday morning. A one o'clock games, Jer, and uh, for me are always um, a bit of a scramble. You're up early trying to have that pre-match meal and it's it's early, it, it's an early time in the day to to get the body up and running. I, I, don't, I don't know if any rugby players would like the, the kick-off time at one o'clock, but actually having to get out to the airport um, really early Sunday morning and travel over. Um, I know Dan McFarland saying, look, it's not an excuse, but it obviously had an effect on them because they were... They were dead in their feet. Um, 
They looked like they were shell shocked then with the the start at sale. Had they never reacted, and they're a better team than that. You know, Ulster are a better team than that. But psychologically, is where at times in the last number of years where we've asked questions about about Ulster and that that hard edge and that ability to find a performance or find a little bit of grit and determination. Um, so it was surprising. I think it caught everyone on the hop yesterday. Um, and maybe the week before against Leinster in, 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 in the RDS has had an effect that, um, uh, you know, that psychological blow and that second half performance and, and loss to Leinster. But right across the board, it was a good Ulster side that was picked. Um, they were really dreadful and they've got to pick themselves up for La Rochelle now at, on Saturday, which... It's a tough task in one sense, but but it's easy to 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 get yourself up after such a bad performance. Um, and credit to Sale, they were very abrasive and strong and aggressive, and and that's what you get um, from them. But big worries for Ulster, I think, physically they were dominated right across the board in every facet of the game. And like I know, Quinny, they were missing some some big players, Henderson, Cooney, and, and Balakoon not involved, but. Like has too much been made of the the travel disruption? I know, <clears throat> look, it's not it's not ideal when you're even travelling in two different groups. I think some of them went to Birmingham Airport and some to Liverpool. Uh, far from ideal, but at the same time, it's a professional team that they have to be ready to maybe cope with little little uh, bumps in the road like that. Yeah, Shane. Look, um, if Ulster went there and lost the game and or, or won the game, it, you know, people are saying, well, this is not an issue. Mm. It, it has to be. There's no way that you can put that kind of a performance down to this Ulster team. They are better than that. Um, and I just know myself, I would, like, that would, you know, be really, really stressful and, and unsettling for a team. You know, you think of one o'clock kickoff, so they're out at the airport at seven or half seven in the morning. I know, Those guys it, are probably up It's at only four, Manchester five though. o'clock in the morning. Like, it's not, it's not like know. they have to go to South Africa. I, I know, I know, but I'm just saying, Ger, one o'clock kickoffs, this is my own opinion, one o'clock kickoffs anyway, even if you're in a hotel, you're up at half eight, eight, half eight, trying to have pre-match meals and stuff like that. Getting the right fuels in, getting the right food, all that kind of stuff didn't happen with Ulster, I'd say. Um, they're probably out at the airport at five o'clock in the morning, players trying to get organised. So, okay. Um, so- I, look, they're, what I'm saying is they're better than that. We get a result 39 nil. That's that's pretty shocking. Um, so it has to have had an effect. Should they have been better? Absolutely. Are but, they a better team than that? Yes. Does it ask question marks about their mentality and not being able to generate a little bit of a chip on the shoulder with that stuff? Um, that's the problem I'm saying. So we're saying there is problems, but it had an effect. Yeah. And they, they've got to learn and... and be okay. able to deal with adversity better. Well, we'll see. We'll see what the response is like against La Rochelle, who obviously had an amazing win at the weekend and think they are cooking with gas at the moment. So uh, it, it is a big challenge. But if if there's a second result like that in Europe, then that's a massive letdown from where we were last year. But let's let's put a pin on that one and we'll we'll accept that the, the travel was an issue and if they can respond next week, we'll take it from there. We, we should talk about um, Leinster and uh, they showed Stuart Lancaster what... Uh, a difficult job he's going to have next season when he takes over Racing because notwithstanding their travel problems they were sensational yeah it was it was probably one of um, one of the best performances I've seen and that I can remember out of Leinster I know they won't get too carried away and say that um, you know some people will say well look Racing were really poor and um, but Leinster were just it was an unbelievable performance. The the tempo, the pace, and one of the big things that sticks out for me here is is you know obviously Leinster have a lot of quality skills. They're well coached, but they're so fit, um, and the vast majority of these play these players play for Ireland, and it's one of the reasons why Ireland have been really good in the last eighteen months to two years is because of the tempo, the energy, um, not just with the ball, but you know when you're 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 you know, Rassing attacking against Leinster and they've some big, strong X Factor players, quality, but it's sometimes um, you know, you you the collective desire from from Leinster to defend and harass and and hound Rassing out of it right across the board, not a minute's peace. 
had they, you know, around the breakdown, the pressure from the, the defensive players on the inside, that hunting desire to get there and make tackles. And and then, you know, they have that finesse to play, to play their game and score brilliant tries. And, um, you know, talking, to score six, you're talking about six Gary, tries. Gary Ringrose, right? Uh, incredible with the ball in hand. But there was a, a, a block kick where he must have run, I don't know, 70, 80 metres at full pace to get there. And it's a full length diving goalkeeper-esque and that's the type of thing that just sends a jolt of electricity through his teammates he wasn't even man of the match but like there was five or six players who were absolutely sensational and then obviously Caelan Doris is man of the match because he's Caelan Doris and he's just playing at that level that he's at at the moment so um, hard not to get uh, excited slash carried away if you're a Leinster fan I know you're well, saying they're, they're they, not going to get carried away but no they won't but they've just um, they've given everyone a reminder how good they are and, and the type of game they can play and you know what the work rate, the honesty and that fitness level, it makes a huge difference. Honestly, believe me, you know, when, when you have so many guys who are so fit um, and they can just put in so much effort and they have that attitude around how hard they work, that culture is created by the coaches and obviously driven by the players. Yeah. Um, so right across the board, they were just on song. And, you know, I know they had their travel issues, but... Um, they got there the night before, at least. Yeah, um, it, it like does help. To, to, one, to bring up to bring up that kind of a performance. And one thing, Jerry, I will say about this Leinster side: you're now looking at five, six, seven guys in this team, and that might be some of them might be mightn't be happy with me saying this, but because they might think they're involved, it should be should be included. There's five or six guys in this Leinster team now that you're you're putting a world class bracket beside them. Van der Fleer, Doris, Dan Sheehan, Furlong, Ring Rose. Um, James Lowe getting there? It's, James Lowe is right up there. He's, he's, he's performances with, um, you know, the power. We'll so when you can pick too. a team, so we're, we're yeah, talking Sexton, about a contrast. There. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, but we, he's, he's the obvious one. Furlong and, and Sexton have, are, are not there, but you're now picking five, six more, more guys. So you're thinking if there was a world team of the year at the moment the form they're showing and the quality they're showing across Europe here and the quality they showed in New we're, Zealand we're not going to clip this though we're not going to tell the rest of the rugby world that we feel this way this is just our little secret no, but, we're not telling anybody yeah, about but just because they're going to say we're the back, away yeah. yeah but on the back of New Zealand look it's the, and, and you talk about the contrast the depth in other teams yeah. this is why they're so good because you know Caelan Doris's performance on Saturday and, and he's just a wonderful player he's a top Top class international player who's constantly on it, on it all the time. So, you know that's the luxury Leinster have. They have the quality and we're, they have that depth. And um, we're out and of time. The, it was reflected in their performance. We're out of time, Quinny. But I know um, weekends like this, um, sometimes there can be whispers. Is there any any whispers on Leinster coaching? Anything else that you're hearing over the weekend? As regards someone replacing Stuart Lancaster, yeah. is it? Yeah. Um, no, I just. Um, y- you were probably the one that was breaking the story about Scott Robertson. Oh no, last I wasn't. So, I was just just mm-hmm. repeating what I you, heard. You picked it up somewhere. Yeah, you yeah. picked it up somewhere. Well, for any coach, it's obviously an attractive proposition when you see a performance like that to align yourself with a team like that and the players at the moment. So, um, I'm not hearing, um, okay. you know, who's who's going to come in at the moment. All right, Quinny, good stuff. Thanks, a million. Cheers, lad. Thanks. More from Alan, of course, on Friday. It is 13 minutes past nine. OTBAM is brought to you live with Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Here's what's on OTB Sports Radio for you across the day. At one o'clock, it's OTB Gold with Colm Gooch Cooper. Splunk uh, at three o'clock. Classic Game Club is Celtic versus Rangers from the year 2000. And OTB Gold is Mick O'Connell at 80 from six. Follow us across all our social channels and subscribe to the OTB Podcast Network for all the best in latest sports content. After this short break... Now we're going to talk Gavin Comiskey live on the line from the World Cup in Qatar. OTB <laughs> This is OTB Sports Radio. The Club Championship Show on OTB Sports. I always used to give Owen Sheehan a good bit of grief for his power rankings. They aren't easy, Will. I have Kilmacud Croaks as the number one team in the country. As a group of players, we have not done one minute of video analysis of any team this year. Don't miss a moment of the GA Club Championship. Download the OTB Sports app, subscribe to the GA podcast feed, and watch the Club Championship show every Wednesday across OTB's social channels. 
Are you a sports fanatic who loves to travel? Then sportspass.ie is for you. Log on for the chance to win the trip of a lifetime in 2023 to a top global sporting event. Eight winners get to choose from 12 incredible prizes, including trips to the Women's World Cup in Australia, the Super Bowl, the Masters and WrestleMania. All prizes include return flights, accommodation and tickets for two people from anywhere in the world. That's sportspass.ie. You win, you choose. OTB AM With Gillette Get into your flow With the new Gillette Labs Razor With exfoliating bar Right we're going to try and um, Make sense of the World Cup Quarter final weekend uh, And we're going to join Gavin Komsky in Qatar Gavin good morning to you How are you? Alright Jer How's it going? Um, that was ridiculous really the level of uh, What we saw at the weekend we were, We've been talking the whole way through Like you want some shocks but you don't want too many shocks because weak teams end up getting there. But Morocco aren't a weak team. They're here totally on merit. No, no, no. Uh, I've covered all their games. I've gone very, uh, I've gone a bit North African throughout my uh, World Cup experience. And uh, before the tournament, I spoke to Kil- Kev Kilban, I think about this in one of the early columns he did as well. If you break it down, they've got like two or three before the tournament now, they had two or three Champions League quality players. And the rest were high level. I think there's only two or three in in the starting eleven that play football in Morocco. Sorry, Bono plays in Saudi Arabia. Um, but if you go through the team, that you no, know, he's Sevilla actually. Sorry, but the, there was a high level: La Liga, Premier League, some really good players, and like it was always on for them. And then they have in their coach, well, he uh, is just he's just another level of tactical news. He said a very clever thing. He was basically like, I've been this good a coach for ten years, but nobody in Europe will hire an Arab. And so he, he got his spoke in on that one. And he, he he's right, to be honest. Um, it's not a surprise if you've been watching them. And I actually have been watching them for a couple of months. Um, and if you look like Amrabat, uh, though, has probably been the revelation of the tournament. Either him or Unani. They've just, they, like, they've just taken apart every midfield. And they like what they did to Spain, how they held on, how they picked them apart and dominated De Bruyne and Belgium. Like, they really did. So, yeah, it's a shock if you're coming in late to them. But um, if you've been keeping an eye on them, even before um, uh, while he came in as the coach in August, they were, they'd were gone, they'd won 20 of 26 matches under the Bosnian manager before that. And that was without Z- Zilic coming back. And he's come back and he's been a revelation. He's like uh, a brilliant kind of showman player who also slips into the system and is an auxiliary right back. So um, it's... The Arab world now firmly believes, and the African world firmly believes they can win the entire World Cup. Like it's it's becoming, it's not just a whisper anymore. It's really becoming something special. And presumably, you're hearing this manifest itself in the stadium and around. There's been, you know, we we we'll obviously talk about everything else and and the the rest, the corruption that led us to the point where we're at the World Cup in Qatar. But um, presumably, they're the uh, adopted home team at this point. Yeah, um, there's Moroccans everywhere in the world. Morocco, the, the, the parallels to Irish football in the early 90s are, are enormous, except they have 40 million people and they have about 10 million expats. I'm talking first generation expats around the world. So they're in the Middle East, in the entire region. I couldn't believe it after the Spain game when I was walking through this, the souk on kind the of way home. I got off early. I got off the, the metro early just to walk through it all. And it was it was Moroccan families so like they're from the region, they were driving home the next morning, you know, they came and did a, like they, it wasn't uh, people, obviously thousands have come from Morocco, but all over the Middle East there's Moroccans of all different classes and uh, educated, uneducated, all over here working because they can slip and slide into it. And it's evident throughout the world that the support for them is enormous. I think the only Arab country or only African country that hasn't really got in behind them is Algeria, the neighbours. But like, just try and imagine in like 1990, no, 94, imagine in 94 if Ireland had a team that was not at the end of its kind of cycle, that wasn't a bunch of old guys, that was at their absolute peak um, and were in America. What, uh, just imagine how the support would generate to be Irish Americans coming out, they're coming out of all angles, you know. Imagine we got to a, that semi over there. That's what's happening now. And it's the support is everyone is behind them. The Qataris, 
you, you can see the Qataris at games because they're all they're in all white and they come in late to every match. And you can see them because they don't celebrate, they don't move. And there's patches of white in all the red around all these stadiums, which are being very badly run. It's really hard to get into stadiums. It's like it was half empty 20 minutes, 20 minutes into the game, the quarterfinal. It was just disgraceful stuff. But you can see the, the, the local Qataris because the Moroccans are just bouncing. I mean, I'm talking like children. Uh, grown men, grannies, they're all just up and down singing and dancing and the guitarists are just sitting there like as is their tradition not to show too much emotion in public and so you can see all of that but they're there they're coming out in massive numbers where they haven't come out in massive numbers since Qatar's like nightmare opening match but they're they were fa- they're fascinated with Argentina, they're fascinated with Brazil and they're really really taken, like the Arab world is completely locked into this. I know a lot of Moroccans around the world and who have no interest in football and they're really tuned in now it's, it's pretty special stuff it is uh, getting mentioned everywhere that like their achievement, obviously, first African team, first Arab team, like it's coming up in the NFL commentaries last night where, oh, what yeah. about that story about Morocco? It's kind of, it is this kind of uh, crossover that's pulling the whole world in. Um, so like at this stage, we obviously hope that they manage to continue with the level of performance, but like there's no sign of them falling over. Yeah, the only thing I will note, though, is the team are falling apart a little bit. Um, the West Ham centre-back, he's injured, Naid uh, Aguerd, um, who's been injured a lot for West Ham, so you haven't seen him. He's absolutely world-class. And the captain, the other centre-back, Roman Sice, he got carried off now with a torn hamstring. So, the kind of... The, now, Amrabat is the heart of the team. Um, I was actually sitting watching. We watched it again last night, and I was sitting beside Kev Kilban, and he was like... There was just moments in the play. He was like, forget about the game. Just watch him now. He just plugs holes. It's very Roy Keenish, And I think Liverpool are looking at him to sign him. He just, and I know the manager um, went last summer, he went for a random weekend over to, over to Florence, went and spent some time in the Fiorentina training camp to tell him that he's a Champions League midfielder, to tell him if he does a couple of A, B and C, he'll be either in the Premier League or at a Barcelona or at something in the next couple of months. And he'll be the absolute gel. He'll be the absolute key man in the Moroccan team. And he said all of this after the Croatia game, and he's just gotten better and better and better. He's probably in the media, the, the post-match and the pre-match Moroccan media is brilliant. If you can link into it or see it or get it, it's, it's, it's unbelievable stuff because uh, the coach is brilliant. He's so clever and so smart. But also the fact that the journalists do, they, they kind of lose the run of themselves a little bit where some of them are getting up going, I have no question. I just want to tell you that you are, I love you and uh, w- the whole country is behind you. And there's a lot of this like uh, crying as, as they ask a question at the end. They go, is there, so they, they give a big speech and they go, is there any injury updates or anything else going on? But it's, um, yeah, everything, everything around them is, the same as Argentina now, everything around them is a massive event because their people are here. Their people are here in the tens of thousands and how we have France, Morocco. Well, the most interesting thing is Hakimi against Mbappé, two best friends, two Paris Saint-Germain players, which also means the Qataris have skidded in the game, so they're fascinated by it. But al Stadium is out in the middle of the desert. Um, it's going to be really difficult to get. A lot of Moroccans are trying to come to games and just kind of get in without tickets. They've been accused of it. I think a lot of them are coming with tickets and it, they're coming in such vast numbers. There's no metro out there. It's already been a major problem at the Al Tumna Stadium outside. There was a couple of near, near really scary moments about near crushes. And I'd be really worried about the France. There won't be that many French people here. There's not that many European, except for the English, who are now gone. Um, but the Albaid Stadium is extremely difficult to get to. Um, they have no experience of how to run major tournaments. And it could be a really worry for how they can act. Because there's, there's, there is tens and tens of thousands of Moroccans who are trying to get tickets on the black market, even though the prices are off the charts. But getting to that stadium is going to be a real test of how this tournament's legacy it will be remembered. We've even seen images, Gavin, like I saw on the TV at halftime, I think, of the match, like fans being shown, <clears throat> excuse me, coming in like, you know, 20, 25 minutes into the match. Now, thankfully, they, they managed to get in in time to see the Moroccan goal, but that just is fairly bonkers that that can happen at a World Cup. My interpretation of it is, and from talking to people before the, st- the match and outside and afterwards, and Moroccans and Moroccan families and um, who came, is there was a there's such a fear here that they don't have a repeat of the Wembley or the Stade de France experience for the Euros final or the Champions League final. That when they and a lot of the police are, are not from here; they've, they've been brought in uh, and they've been trained. Like all the staffs and all the people here, they've been trained within an inch of their lives about how to do things. So caution is comes first. So when there's a swell of a crowd. They've closed the gates and they've stopped people and then they've tried to trickle them in because they, they, they literally just don't know how to run uh, 
World Cups because it's an extremely difficult thing to do. And if you don't have experience of massive major events in your country, like Dublin would never ha- be able to do this with eight stadiums. We, c- we can barely do Crow Park and the Aviva Stadium on the same day. I think, I think it's only happened a couple of times and it's not a good idea, you know. So when, when they come in, they stop them and they, so they're, the people are getting really desperate there. And like a, you can't get an Uber anywhere near it. There was no metro to the, to the stadium that Morocco played most of their games in. So you have to walk eight kilometres south from the city. I really wish I was talking about football here, by the way, but you're sitting in at a World Cup quarterfinal going, where is the other 20,000 people? Knowing that there's 100,000 Moroccans up the road, you know? And uh, even still, the, the atmosphere of uh, Moroccan and Argentinian games mm. is something, is just incredible. It's something that'll stay with me to the end of my days. I never thought I could see bigger than some of the experiences I've had in Club Park and other Ireland football matches over the years. But what I've seen with the Argentinian fans in Lucille and Moroccans just everywhere in the city is, it's really made, it's saved the World Cup, it's made it. It's kind of overshadowed all the shameful stuff that's been done by FIFA and the Supreme Committee. It's... Um, it also it means that you're you know you're at the you're you're at the, the, the a World Cup you know what I mean you really do feel like it's I mean, the games are it's unbelievably brilliant but um yeah and there's there's a whole Irish story element when you look at the Moroccans if you're here you just see the, the granular thing and what what the FAI could have done in the 90s and what we didn't do like the way the Moroccans have gone in and scouted in Europe second third generation players Zidic is a great one like he's uh, there he's their Zidane he's the Zidane that Algeria should have had if you know what I mean. Um, like he was Dutch he got into Dutch squad when he was about 22, 23 and then somebody a scout or an agent or somebody from Morocco got to him and said you've grown up in Holland your entire life but they've always treated you like a Moroccan so why would you let the Dutch now treat you like a Dutch player because you're about to sign for Ajax and so he flipped and became and went to Morocco and Van Basten was his, one of his early coaches said he was stupid and he turned around his quote in response to Van Basten was yes uh, Michael Van Basten was a great player but not a very good manager <laughs> I mean, it is an incredible story and I think uh, they're definitely winning friends and influencing people for sure. Um, we should talk about the, the Argentina game. Um, yeah. Like, the whole thing is, uh, I mean, it's a, it, there will be documentaries made about the game itself. Like, the, um, we, we talk about the football in a moment, but this is the game that Grant Wall falls ill at. Yeah. Um, I don't think, we, we all kind of came together, a lot of English and Irish journalists and a bunch of Canadians were there last night. We kind of came together to decompress the whole experience because, um, like, it's something, for, I have to say, it is for two reasons. It's, it's, it's an occasion and an event in that massive World Cup final stadium in the brand new city in Lucille. Argentina, Netherlands is something that none of us will ever forget, simply because Grant died in front of a good few uh, Irish reporters' eyes. I was a couple of rows down, um, and the whole exp- the whole the traumatic experience of what was happening as the penalty shootout was starting. So that meant all of us were on, like, in this, and like, poor us, but, like, we were in this incredible, torturous period of rewrites because you'd written everything. We, and, like, for example, the Irish Times was ho- literally holding the Saturday newspaper for me to file my front page of the sports, 900 words. And I'd written this brilliant 900 words about Messi's uh, assist and, and the whole process of creating that goal and everything. And that was all gone out the window when Weggers came on I'm saying his name now, he's the Burnley Basictus uh, striker, but the seven foot tall guy comes on and scores two goals and did a goal in the 99th minute of injury time to send us into extra time, which just meant everyone was rewriting. Like there was a, you heard all this before, there was a collective groan across the whole press box when it went 2 2, and then a massive fight broke out, which I don't think you've seen on TV. Massive fight broke out between the Dutch and the uh, Argentinian players after the game, not the one. Uh, that was started by kicking into the dugout. Another one, so we were watching this and trying to rewrite, tearing up your pieces. And then the grand stuff happened just at the end of extra time where he took ill and there was a 20-minute period of, res- of attempted resuscitation for him. And uh, yeah, it was um, it was incredibly difficult to um, retain focus because you, you, you literally had no choice because, again, as I said, the newspaper was waiting for my copy. But there was people coming down who were moved down to seats who were sitting beside me who were in a terrible and awful state because of what they'd just witnessed. And then we we just had to we just had to keep working and get on with it. And I remember being at the press conference after. There was a couple of people who I know who were a bit shook. And uh, uh, me and another guy, we just left. We didn't wait for Messi. <laughs> Imagine like being at a World Cup quarter final and going, it doesn't really matter, you know. Uh, we just went and got the train home. And then the, the flip side of that is you're on this you're on the metro back into Doha, and there's thousands of Argentinians who are just deliriously happy, who have no knowledge about Grant, Grant Wall, and he's a brilliant American soccer journalist. And I actually, 
I, I was actually going to say to him, I didn't want to be kind of fanboy, but I'd seen him a good few times in the press box. I don't know him. A lot of the other lads did. But I remember that in 2002, he wrote the, the chosen one, the LeBron piece for Sports Illustrated. That was the sem- when LeBron James was 17 years old. And uh, they got to him. They knew he was going to be... Like they were already saying he's going to be better than Kobe Bryant. He could be the next Michael Jordan. And Grant was the guy who did the first big interview. And they put a 17-year-old high school kid who hadn't even been got into the draft yet on the cover of Sports Illustrated. And that was Grant, that was one of Grant Wall's great, great pieces of work. And it's from 20 years ago. So, um, yeah, it was that whole that whole thing. And it's, um, I, my, my thoughts go out like, to his family and a lot of his friends who were here and a lot of people who worked with him who... Um, football probably one of the greatest games of football you'll ever see or I don't know what, what your reception was or what you saw at home but it was one of the most in, in, in insane beautiful events that I've ever been at and um, for a lot of people it's uh, only going to be remembered for one thing unfortunately yeah for sure um, in, incredible difficult circumstances and as you say condolences to his family it's just a horrific situation for them and um, you know hopefully uh, they find some peace Um the, the football, obviously, I mean, uh, it being football continues. Um, has there been fallout from the rows? And Emmy Martinez basically saying this whole thing is corrupt. Like uh, his post-match interview is one of the most remarkable winning interviews I've ever seen from anybody in any sport ever, where the interviewer keeps prompting him to go, yeah, but you just, it, it was great. And he's like, yeah, but the referee, what was that all about? <laughs> so um, is there a potential balance yeah. or do they want to just, like not ban anybody because it's a World Cup semi final. What happens? Referee lost control. I think that was. I hope. I presume that was apparent on the TV. He also lost the Brazilian referee in England, France completely lost control. It was it looked completely out of his depth. Um, the uh, I, I you know the, the now famous picture of uh, the, the Argentinian lads mm-hmm. going right up into Dutch faces as they run towards. Uh, uh, the goal after winning. There's a backstory to that picture that needs to be told. Yeah, they well totally deserved us. <laughs> yeah, no, like Messi said it afterwards. Like, have you ever seen Messi as angry as he was afterwards? He went that thing where he puts his hands up to his ears. That was because of Louis Van Gaal uh, treated Riquelme terribly in the one year he was at Barcelona and didn't want him, and so that was Riquelme's celebration. So he was going doing that to Louis Van Gaal. There was. Like how Virgil van Dijk didn't get sent off for that body check again? I presume you saw that. Um, that was in play. He didn't even get booked. Um, there was a lot of stuff, but yeah, the Dutch had been completely needling the Argentinians, and like the Argentinians obviously don't need an excuse, you know. And once they won the penalty shootout, yeah, they stuck it to them. But it looks there's a perception out there, and it's all over social media. That the Argentinians are a disgrace, and they're they're bad sportsmen, and all that. Everyone was at it. It was uh, it was chaos, and the referees not allowed to show red cards. I'm I don't know with certainty, obviously, but my opinion is that the referees are just not allowed to show red cards at this tournament. And so it, it should have been, there should have been, it, it could have been controlled and calmed down by a couple of cards. Also, Messi's blessed that he didn't get a second yellow, um, which would have been a nightmare. So there's something in that. But uh, I think it being FIFA and it being a World Cup semi final, I think they'll just creep past this and let's just get to the semis. And again, no, no, no red cards in the semis. Let's just get, in, get ourselves into the final. A lot of people, I'd say, who work in FIFA just want to get the hell out of here as well because um, it's the best football tournament. It's probably the best World Cup ever. It's certainly the best World Cup I can ever remember. 86, I was only a kid, so but 86 had such an impact on a lot of people my age, and I presume you as well, Jared. But uh, this is just, it's been phenomenal. But off the pitch, if you get off the beaten track and you, do, you don't stick on the, the FIFA buses and you don't go out to their, their big media center that has beautiful food and beautiful... It's, do you know what the media centre's like here? It's in the big Qatar National Library. It's like as if Google took over all the media houses in Ireland. And it, it's like a, it's basically like one big giant Google office where you can sleep there, you can do your laundry there, there's a medical centre, there's everything. But if you leave that and get a few Ubers, talk to the Ubers, which are very cheap, obviously, for, because of the petrol. Uh, and if you walk to stadiums, if you go to the worker estates where they live, I'm, I'm writing a piece that's probably going to be published the Monday after the tournament, just about everything else I've seen outside of the tournament. And it's... It's vast, and for all the magnificence we're watching and the brilliance, and there's so many things we haven't even talked about here, uh, like the Argentinian fans just going to war with the FIFA, the blaring of the music and these fake bands at halftime, and everything. the Argentinian fans who are here in their droves, and they found ways of, of affording it, and they, they've taken over a little town, which I have to go down and see. It's kind of like, looks like the old Ballymun Flats, and they're all in there, and they're in there every day partying. It's, it's an old workers' village. So there's so there's just so many other things happening off the pitch, and the treatment of hotel staff, the treatment of FIFA workers who might get a day off working ten, twelve hour days, made stand up. 
no breaks for so much hotel stuff. Like, we think we're working hard and then you look at them and like we get to go home, we're well paid, we get to go home for Christmas, we're going to get breaks after this. They just go pour into another job. Like it's the, the cruelty. Miguel Delaney wrote a piece in the Independent, the London Independent, which I sent people towards where he compared it to what it must have been like for Europeans visiting the deep south of America in the 1860s. And he's not exaggerating. Um, it's, it's, it's horrific, some of the things you see. Like, if you don't have a plan, if you work here, you live here, you can make good money, you don't pay income tax, you can, it, it's a gateway, there is a huge thing, it's a gateway to get a visa if you're African to America, to another place. But um, if you don't have a plan when you get here, or if you come here as a, in a refugee status, I met an Afghanistani taxi man last night, there's no way out, there's no escape. Um, and it's like, uh, because it, it's so strange the mood because you're, you're the joy of all the football we're experiencing. But then on the days off, you see the grimness of Doha and the treatment of people who are, they're not even called humans, they're called workers all the time. And uh, it's, it's stuff that uh, it'll stay with me forever, unfortunately. I look forward to reading that piece. Um, hopefully you'll be home by the time it's published. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm home. I think I fly out like at like 2 a.m. after the World Cup final, so um, we'll see. Listen, great stuff, Gav. Stay safe. Thanks a million for joining us. Cheers. So, Gavin Cummins, give me the Times there. Um, trying to capture that broad sweep of all the stuff that happened over the weekend. Jesus, the split emotions, like, you know, when you, when you talk about the, the grimness of some of the things, as Gav says in guitar, the absolute despair of what happened to Grant Wall and you compare it to the football it's like it's just I think a lot of the journalists over there I'm sure just don't even know what to think after that weekend No um, and the uh, football keeps coming uh, relentlessly like it always does and uh, we're looking forward to two of the biggest games of all time that is the the split emotions that FIFA are uh, really hoping that everybody has because that way they get to take the money and put the football out and we're like oh the World Cup was uh, on balance you'd say pretty good right that's that's how it all works 9.36 this morning uh, thanks very much for uh, being with us today OTBAM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day we're back tomorrow with Gaz Pal Kevin Kilman on the line from Qatar Stephen Rotter will be on to talk about the new era of Mayo football and plenty more besides right now we're going to leave you with football writer Philippe Auclair in conversation with Joe following the incredible World Cup quarterfinals as his nation remained in the driving seat to retain the World Cup have a truly festive day chat tomorrow so we're talking World Cup, we're down to four. Argentina, Croatia on Tuesday evening is coming your way and then France, Morocco on Wednesday evening. Drama across the final matches in the group stages, the last 16 and now the quarterfinals. It has been extraordinary, you would have to say. France 2, England 1 is what we're talking about now. Fine margins has been the very common refrain across the board. True many gave France the lead, brilliant strike. One touch and strike from a standing start through the legs of Jude Bellingham, curled away from Pickford. Harry Kane made it one all from the penalty spot 10 minutes into the second half. Then against the run of play, I think it's fair to say, and via Harry Maguire's hand, Olivier Giroud did his thing. He scored what would be the winner. And then, of course, there was the late drama. Harry Kane unable to repeat the trick from the penalty spot, blasting over the bar in the 84th minute. Marcus Rashford's free kick also just over the bar was the last kick of the game. Philippe Auclair is with us. That summary, of course, completely unnecessary. The whole world made a point of watching this game. Uh, this was a quarterfinal of a grand scale, Philippe, an absorbing game. Probably the game of the tournament so far, so in terms of the quality of, of some of the football. And in the end, the team that is used to winning has won, and the team that is, unfortunately for them, used to uh, falling late in tournaments um, um, fell again. And uh, there is, of course, as you can imagine, great enjoyment in France, re rejoicing even, but um, there's also uh, the awareness of the fact that uh, France progressed to the semi-finals uh, through their talent, uh, their determination, their will to win, but also with a big slice of luck. Mm. And it's such an unsatisfactory thing to reach for luck but even Didier Deschamps who knows what it takes to win across his career he made the point of saying there was lots of, you know, not lots of luck but certainly a fair degree of luck in there and that's uh, required and the English press actually is quite interesting to read through the papers this morning because you never quite know will there be vilification or retribution for various uh, figures involved be that Kane or be that Southgate but the English press right across the border saying this is different this is a different England loss at this stage yeah, it, it feels completely, it felt completely different during the game as well because 
we remember what happened um, against Croatia in 2018. We remember what happened against Italy in the final of Euro 2020 and England taking the lead and uh, suddenly uh, um, deciding that it was time to go back in their shell. Um, this time it didn't happen at all. Um, England were on the front foot, played quite bravely uh, at times and were faithful to what their manager had said um, would be their game plan, which is basically to try and expose France's weaknesses. And they caused huge problems. And had, had it not been for another exceptional performance by Hugo Lloris, whom I think is certainly carries on being underrated, which is extraordinary for somebody who has had the career that he's had with uh, his national team, um, would have probably uh, uh, be, you know, given England a place in, in the semis. So, Yes, I, I think that the whole media climate, in any case, uh, has changed around this England team since Gary Southgate took over, and um, that there is far um, there is not the kind of animosity and antagonism that there have been under previous managers, where you felt that people were just there waiting to snipe uh, at them as soon as something was not quite working. But I think it was so obvious that England actually did all they could do uh, in the in the present circumstances. Um, also, I think a great deal of uh, respect for the dignity with which they accepted uh, their fate. Uh, the fact that Gary Southgate and quite a few of his players uh, were loath to uh, criticize the referring, which was very criticizable, but they didn't try to hide behind that. And I think this this kind of dignity um, is reflected in the way the game has been covered and, and also has been talked about among fans. That plus the fact, of course, the quality of the performance and the age of that team, um, which is still very low, um, make it look more like uh, another step in the right direction. Mm. And um, I, I was talking to some to some French friends uh, and, and some English friends as well too uh, earlier this morning, and I said, well, maybe this moment will be something comparable to what Sevilla 1982 was for France. Um, when we felt that we had, you know, lost some penalties to the Germans, but completely and deservedly, but it was used as a, a springboard to something bigger, which was the, the win in the Euro 1984. Sometimes that, that's what happens. And there's definitely feeling, I think, that the arc of growth of that England team hasn't come to an end uh, on that night, mm -hmm. but, but that on the contrary, there is something to be built on, especially if Gary Southgate carries on uh, taking care of that England team. It's a, a, a slight tangent, admittedly, but one wonders to what extent media sensibilities in the UK are just simply changing regardless, or to what extent Gareth Southgate and his demeanour has maybe expedited that change in coverage of the team. I think he, I think the latter. Uh, he's found a willing audience because I think people wanted to fall back in love with uh, with England, uh, within the fan community, but also within the media. And don't forget that those media are, you know, the people who write and broadcast for them are England fans, most of them. And um, so, yes, there, there was willing on both sides. And I, 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 it would feel really untoward. I mean, I've I've heard a few criticisms of Kane and and Southgate, but they're coming from a a fringe of of lunatics. Really, there's no other word for them. And and he's the transformation he's achieved um, is something that everybody is very grateful for. And to be honest, look, looking at it from the outside, from a more neutral point of view, if a Frenchman can be neutral in the present circumstances, it would be complete madness to behave otherwise. This is a very, very good team. And if you look at what Southgate has done after inheriting a team that had lost to Iceland at the Euro, um, took them to the semi-finals uh, of, of the World Cup and the Nations League, uh, the final of the Euro and now quarterfinal, which they lost just and perhaps because of bad luck against the reigning world champions. Well, come on, this is this is remarkable progress. And in fact, if you look at um, the England team over a period of a decade or so, um, this this is probably the most successful that it has ever been. Mm. Um, you know, because the 1966 triumph was not followed or preceded by other great triumphs. Actually, it was preceded and followed by other great disappointments. Yes, this is different. This is a consist consistently a consistent series of results at the highest level. Being one of the top six or eight nations, football nations in the world, is no small achievement. Mm. 
generally given the vagaries of football games don't pan out as billed and this was billed as Mbappe versus Walker and yet the uh, drama and the uh, deciding factors were elsewhere that first 20 minutes uh, centred for me and I'm, I'm curious for your thoughts around the player that you have flagged in all of our conversations Antoine Griezmann and then oh God, yes. the other player you flagged across this tournament has been Olivier Giroud and they both came through for France last night in a big way. That first 20 minutes, France had the better of the game, certainly, and Griezmann was at the heart of that. Yes, well, I'm, I'm running out of superlatives for Antoine Griezmann, um, who is, for me, the player of the tournament. Has certainly been the player of the tournament for France, um, ever present, well, except against Tunisia, of course, which was a very, very strange game. Um, but... Uh, He's been put in a position um, where he has to do things that he's perhaps never done before in his footballing career. He's always been a nine and a half or a, or a ten support striker, sometimes a, a centre forward. But he's never been this extraordinary mix of a six, a seven, an eight and a ten, uh, which has been throughout the tournament. And the first 45 minutes I, he played uh, last night, to me, honestly, I'm, tra- I'm I'm really struggling to find another 45 minutes by a French midfielder because that's what he is, a midfielder, uh, that can ri- ri- rival with that. I would have to go back a long, long way. And it made me think, if anything, and obviously the uh, for younger listeners that might not be uh, a reference that will say or speak volumes, but he reminded me of what Michel Platini could do at the absolute top of his game. Uh, perhaps, um, you know, the goals, less the goals, which might come later in the tournament. I hope so anyway. But he's been he's been astonishing. But Deschamps deserves a great deal of credit for that, by the way. No, not my, as you perhaps uh, know, he's not exactly a, a manager that I'm enamored with or I was enamored with. But it took a lot of imagination as well to to think, um, okay, we're missing our two best midfielders, Golo Kante, Paul Pogba. What do we do? Well, we're we going to rely on a very young holding midfielder who's going to... Uh, be Makelele Mark II, uh, Aurélien Chouameni, plus, plus the goals. Uh, we're going to have uh, Adrien Rabiot, who is a very inconsistent player um, in a more attacking role. And we'll count on Antoine Griezmann, a nine and a half uh, or nine, who is going to play in the kind of Pirlo role, but at the same time be the main creator. I mean, it takes some imagination to do that, and it takes a real. <laughs> it takes some very special managerial talent to make it work, mm. to have people accept it, and, and especially Griezmann, but to make it work in such a beautiful fashion. Yeah. So, on the on that side, as you said, you know, the game perhaps did not happen where some expected it to happen, but um, though you could say that from an England point of view, it did happen where they were expected it to happen because they wanted to nullify Kylian Mbappe, and to be honest. They did uh, for almost all of the game. They also wanted to target uh, the flanks and they did to great effect. I don't think Hernandez would like to come across Bukayo Saka anytime soon. Um, but where the game was lost and won apart from luck was the excellence of Hugo Lloris, again, mm. um, Germany and Griezmann doing their job. And of course, the incredible Olivier Giroud, uh, the man that you can't put down in strikes, you know, becomes France's all-time hmm. uh, leading goal scorer on his own this time, not just with Dittiori, and <laughs> and scoring a goal uh, which, you know, might, in, in retrospect, this is the goal that we might look back on, like we look back on the two goals Lyon Thuram scored in the 1998 World Cup. Yeah. That, that is saying something. Yes. Via Harry Maguire's hand again, so again, the fortunes are at play here. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mbappe, all the same when he gets the ball and in the, in the brief glimpses, brings everyone alive, be it in the stadium or at home. Or indeed, if you're on the pitch next to him, all the England players suddenly um, alive to the danger. I, like, I almost laughed out loud in the build-up to the first goal where Declan Rice, who was a big man and a strong man and a fast man, decided, well, I'm just going to have to take Mbappe down here. I'm just going to have to foul him and take the yellow card and try to go right through Mbappe who rode the challenge and you, and you just think <laughs> this guy is is a touch uh, superhuman so I mean um, one suspects that he'll still have a significant part to play somewhere along the line is France now uh, 
very, very, very firm favourites in your eyes to win the World Cup, Philippe? I think uh, they have to be, uh, regardless of what favourite means in this World Cup. Mm. Uh, if we look back at what happened to Argentina against Saudi Arabia, what happened to Brazil, we could carry on like that. Um, I mean, obviously, Morocco have only conceded one goal, and it was an own goal since the beginning of the tournament. They're superbly organised. They're very, very tough. We don't quite know what the impact of their exertions in previous games is going to be. We don't know how the absence of size um, is going to weigh on their defence, a defence which is already missing a, a few players, but they're so tough to beat. They're, they're, they're as tough as the Greeks were at, at Euro 2004, plus added menace when they counter. They're a very, very fine, uh, they're a very, very fine team. But on the other hand, I do think that France has got the kind of arguments that will make Morocco suffer more than they did um, in, in their games against teams that tended to try and play too slowly around them. Uh, France has got players who can actually make a difference individually uh, and, and I don't hesitate to do that. And it can be Mbappé, absolutely. It can also be uh, Dembele. Uh, it can be Griezmann. Um, and um, and even surprise, surprise, Orlean Chouamini, a goal from outside the box at long last, by the way. We haven't had many of those, have mm. we? And um, so, yeah, France would be the logical favourites for the for the whole tournament, to be absolutely honest with you. And uh, their objective has, has been achieved. You might have heard that uh, Didier Deschamps, whose decision uh, it was to remain or to leave after the tournament, should France reach the last quarter, the, the last quartet, uh, will carry on to Euro 2024. So after 10 years uh, in the hot seat, he still has the energy to carry on, and I can understand why. Um, but yes, it's quite logical that France should um, should be the favourite, and um, certainly for their encounter against, uh, against Morocco. And beyond that, they are more complete outfits than the Argentinian team. They don't have Messi, but they have got Mbappe, and they are more complete. And whether you could discuss whether Croatia has got perhaps a greater balance all through the lines, mm. Um, France has, again, got the edge in terms of, of individuality. So it's quite logical that they should be considered favourites and, and quite, you know, I mean, yeah, I was going to say outstanding favourites, which, by the way, might well have been England's place had they won, which is not something that is going to uh, be easy to uh, to swallow, I think, oh, in I, the days and I, weeks I, and months to I, follow. I agree with you. I, I feel like last night was the final. I felt like that in advance. Yeah. and the quality of the two teams, uh, the quality of the game uh, further uh, makes me think that. So, sorry, you said Deschamps is staying on now. I was under the misapprehension yep. that Zidane was waiting in the wings and we'd have Zidane coming to Dublin next March. So, no. No, no, it will be Didier, uh, oh. not Zizou. Uh, so, yes, I'm terribly sorry okay. to disappoint you. But it, it was the deal that had been uh, passed before the beginning of the competition. Uh, Noël Le Gret and Didier Deschamps, the president of the French FA and Didier Deschamps, got together and said, uh, clearly, uh, our objective is to reach the, the semi-finals. If uh, we reach the semi-finals, the decision to remain or to go will be left to Deschamps. And the decision has been taken. He will remain. He's taken the decision himself. So Zizou will have to wait another couple of years at least. But you know, Deschamps is uh, is not the oldest um, oldest international manager on the on the planet. So if it goes well, expect him to carry on. And mm. perhaps you know, Oscar Tavares, after all, managed Uruguay for fifteen years with some success. Uh, Didier, it will be uh, twelve years when. Uh, Euro 2024 happens, you know, I wouldn't put it past him to carry on beyond sure. that. On uh, Deschamps, so this legendary playing career, and now he's morphed into this, uh, on the verge of being a legendary manager if they succeed over the coming two games. It's interesting yeah. you say you're not so sure if you rate him all that highly. Uh, can you explain <laughs> to me, who's not watching no. France week in, week out, where the, <laughs> the issue is? No, it's not rating him highly. I rate him very highly. Right. It's not that... It's, it's the kind of football that he's made his teams play. But I have to say, I've been pleasantly surprised with this this France team in this tournament. I think they've been far more expansive than they've been in the past. And one of the reasons for that uh, is is the presence of, of Griezmann as, as a creator. 
um, as a deep line creator, and suddenly it changes a lot. The ball travels very, very quickly indeed. I mean, some of the angles of passing, some of the movement in the first 15, 20 minutes against England yeah. was just magnificent yeah. to watch. It yeah. was just absolutely magnificent. And we haven't been used to France playing that way. You know, in 2018, uh, in 2016, uh, France were already the, the strongest team in the Euro and how they lost against Portugal in the final, nobody, nobody still, you know, nobody understands. It's ridiculous. Uh, in 2018, the success was built on defense. It was a very, very strong defense and a very strong midfield with, uh, of course, um, a phenomenon that is Mbappe uh, exploding during that tournament. But it was, you know, the results were built on defensive prowess. And this time, I don't think you would say that France's defensively looks very solid. It doesn't. Uh, Hernandez looks a bit of a liability when he's uh, confronted with a pacey dribbler. Uh, his placement is not the best. His judgment is is sometimes appalling. I mean, the, the foul on Mason Mount, I, I still can't understand how he felt he had to do it. But he did. Um, the varanu um central defensive pairing, even if these are these two are, are, are excellent players, they're still not quite clicking as a pair. Uh, and for normal reasons, I think it was only the fourth or fifth game they've played together. Um, Jules Koundé is also playing out of position. Did all right, by the way, against Foden, but he plays it out of position. So you wouldn't say d- defense is, is their strong point. Their strong point is the, their ability, well, their, their mental strength is, is exceptional. Mm. Uh, the individ- individual uh, qualities of some of the players is also outstanding, but it's also it's the willingness of that team to go forward and to create danger, which honestly is not something you were seeing with Deschamps' team in the past. Yeah. Which is one of the reasons you can respect and admire a manager for his achievements, and I think not to do that for Deschamps would be absolutely ridiculous. But you could at the same time have some regrets, thinking actually that team is winning, but it could be even better than it is with him. But yes, there you okay. go to him. The only thing which matters is winning. Yes, very much so. Uh, I do, speaking of regrets, I do wonder if Griezmann will regret at passing up the chance to have been one of the greatest midfielders of his generation for the last decade. That could be an interesting uh, conversation. Listen, <laughs> he's only 31. <laughs> I give him another four or five years in that role, no problem. Remember sure. how you know Andrea Pirlo um, and 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 others. I think he can do that job for quite a few good years. Uh, I'm curious for your thoughts. I watching very much as a neutral last night. I thought the referee Wilton Sampao of Brazil <laughs> was really, really dreadful. And we've had some interesting refereeing performances this tournament. I thought the foul yeah. on Saka in advance uh, of the first goal was more likely a free than not, but. Beyond that, I thought he was distinctly average and made some strange decisions and he seemed to need to see about 15 replays of the foul on Mason Mount to give that penalty. I mean, I don't know why he needed replays uh, f- 2 through to 14. Uh, your perspective on the referee last night, his contribution? Um, I think it was... It's remarkable that we had such a wonderful game of football with such appalling referring. I don't think that anybody would... Uh, would actually uh, argue the opposite, say that he had a good game. Um, unfortunately, there have been there have been a few like that. Um, I'm actually wondering if Stephanie Frappard shouldn't be given, you know, both semi-finals and the final because hers was one of the only performances that uh, actually made everybody agree that that's a proper referee. Uh, yeah, I mean, Lajos in the um, in, in the Argentina game as well was. Uh, uh, it was just beyond belief. I lost control of the game, and here we had a referee which quite clearly was not quite up, up to scratch. As to taking so much time watching the replays, maybe when he first saw the replay, he, he had a moment, he was struck and thought, how did I miss that? How did yeah. I miss that? Yeah. And um, yes, but the standard of refereeing has been has not been the best, especially in the, the latter stages of the competition, mm. which is strange because normally you would have the best or the better referees being um, given the privilege of, of refereeing those big games. Um, the inconsistency also has been has been a problem uh, from from one ref to the to the next, from one game to the next. So let's hope that the semi-finals are are not marked again by refereeing, um, you know, uh, quarrels and controversies as we had, you know, the uh, Argentina Netherlands game. It was actually toxic, and the referee, the players were the first to be responsible for that. 
But the fact that the referee lost control of the game also played its part. So let's hope we're a bit luckier when it comes to Tuesday and Wednesday. Yes. Uh, before you go, it has been just an extraordinary 48 hours in football and we were making the point in a previous discussion before you came on air that legacies are being decided in the space of hours at the moment. It's akin to that Lenin quote about decades and weeks and weeks and decades. And so Neymar and Ronaldo, there are tears and it's over. Messi is still alive and Mbappe is still alive. Uh, your perspective on the failure of Brazil and then what we've seen from Argentina and Croatia before you go, because, I mean, there's a, there's a novel worth of uh, things to say about all three. Uh, for Brazil, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I'll try to be, I was going to say polite, I'll, I'll try to be fair, but I do have a big problem with the perception of Brazil. I, I, to be honest, I find it completely incomprehensible that people keep talking about Brazil as this uh, huge power, uh, which is also uh, offering us the the most beautiful football on the planet. That's that's rubbish. They don't. They they don't. They haven't for decades. And and uh, this whole circus, the the hype about the Jogo Bonito and so forth. I, I to be I, I'm, I'll be fair with you. I can't stand it. I really can't stand it. And I. I, I cannot see what... OTB AM With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. 